What's good, folks, family, friends, loved ones, enemies, frenemies, wizards, witches, muggles, mudbloods, people of Middle Earth to another episode of Disguised Coverage, the only podcast that gives you an equal amount of blueberries in each muffin and is presented by the best pizza in Buffalo, New York, and that is One Pie Pizza. You can find the online menu in the episode show notes, whether here on YouTube or whichever podcasting app or platform you're listening to this show on. I am your host, Anthony. Find me on Twitter at pro underscore underscore ant. That's pro two underscores A-N-T. In tonight's episode of Disguise Coverage, it is NFL Combine Week here at Disguise Coverage, but also in the NFL. And it's an important week. Uh, you know, the tape is always king, but when it comes to the combine, measurables and metrics and performances there can go a long way in terms of some moving and shaking for draft classes as a whole, but especially specifically and especially with regard to sp specific position groups. I'm already stumbling over my words and we're only a minute and this is going to be, this is either going to be super fun for you or really terrible for me or both potentially. And to talk about the NFL combine with that Buffalo bills lens with specificity and reference to special position groups of need and specific position groups of need for the Buffalo bills. I am joined by someone who I consider extremely knowledgeable, who I love talking ball with, um, and is just one of literally my go-to dudes for bouncing ideas off of when it comes to football in general, but especially come draft time. You folks should know him already. Mr. Russell Brown, now NFL draft analyst uh, for Fantasy Pros, also do stuff for the Lions Wire, also do stuff for betting pros, formerly of Cover One. Everybody kind of knows your face and name around here. You're awesome. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, brother. It's always a, always a fun time. And when you sent me the text, I go, I can't leave Marty Jannetty hanging. I gotta, I gotta join him. I gotta join him. I know the show's going to probably end now, but, um, no, it's good. Shawn Michaels is in the building. The showstopper has arrived. The heartbreak kid is here. Um, we're, we're good. And how about them lines? Thank you, Andrew. We, we're, we're good. Everything is good. How are you, my man? I was good. You know damn well between the two of us. You're so much more Janetti than I am. But also, too, like, I don't want to be Shawn Michaels, so I, I also don't want to be Janetti. Like, I, ugh. Just a bad tag team. Just bad tag team. They were, uh, yeah. They were actually really like, good. But... They were sick, but there was, like, a ton of, like, off, the, I would say off the field issues, but, like, off, <laughs> out the, off outside the, the ring off issues. The mat. Yeah, yeah, off the mat issues between them, like, the, the, the dark side of the ring. Would... The what? What a podcast name that would be for a wrestling podcast, off, off the mat. The mat. That is actually pretty sweet. We need to trademark that. Actually, so show's over. We're going to start a wrestling podcast. Got to trademark that right now. That would be sick. Bringing one pie with us, though. Right? Oh, of course. Of course. I'd bring one pie anywhere we go. It's the. It's literally the... the. Oh, this is awesome. JG says, is this the barbershop? <laughs> is someone getting thrown through the window? And I love to, like, as it's evolved over the years, like, people make the joke that, like, Janetti was a coward and, like, threw himself through the yeah. window instead of Sean kicking him. Like, but, man, what a... Oh, what a moment. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm not a Sean. I don't, I, that's so tough. Like, cause as a Bret Hart guy, I despise Shawn Michaels, but oh man, Royce says we're more like, the that's, that's so insulting. Actually, they were actually really good wrestlers. Like, but just the Mounties, man, also as a Bret Hart guy, I hated the Mounties. That was such a, just call us the headbangers while you're at it. Jesus. I'd rather, I'd way rather be the Mounties than the headbangers. No, <laughs> the headbangers. they had a sweet finisher, but I'd much rather be the Mounties. Um, Although they were kind of, yeah, man, we're getting super off track. NFL Combine, I figured we could off track, but it's fun. But also, I don't want to, like, I don't want to push everybody. Like, here we are at midnight, and we're still rolling because we speak. Like, oh, talking yeah. tag teams, G -G more like Legion of Doom. Russ and I refer, for a little peek behind the curtain, Russ and I refer to ourselves as the Steiner brothers. That's the tag team we've always gone with. Russ, obviously, being a Detroit guy and a Michigan guy, that fits. And the Steiners are legitimately one of the greatest tag teams um, of all time. But ooh, the Legion of Doom, Legion of Doom, and the Dudleys are my two favorite tag teams. Um, of all times, man, killer bees. They're so old. Oh, Matt says the L O D Legion of Draft. That's a podcast name. This is That's fantastic. Unreal. I don't even want to talk about the combine now. This is just so fun, but <laughs> like I would be a liar and I would have severely misled the people if we don't talk about the NFL combine. Russ, you are here. So again, we're, we're gonna dive into a bunch of different pieces tonight, but Again, focusing on those specific position groups of need for the Buffalo Bills in this draft class, wide receiver, defensive tackle, edge, safety. Russ, you and I are going to talk about players at each of those position groups who really can kind of help themselves the most at each of those position groups. Some day one guys, day two guys, day three guys. And it seems like every year, and I ask you this every time you've been on the show, 
but it seems like every time combine rolls around coming out of the combine, there's somebody who just jettisons themselves forward because of a strong combine performance. The example I always give was when I was a little kid and I remember Vernon Davis showed up and wore like nothing but a super tight cutoff shirt and the super tight compression shorts and ran like a four through a high four three or a low four four forty at like huge size and weight and it shot him up to like roughly like a top 10 pick and you get those guys that just shine at the combine i mentioned it a little earlier in the intro and alluded to it a bit but and again i've asked you this like multiple years now how important is the combine for you in terms of your draft rankings your draft analysis like you and i were talking offline um about your top 100 and going through that like does is there a lot of moving and shaking for you personally we know there is for nfl clubs we know that that will matter but for you pure valuation pure scouting going off the tape as much as you do how much does the combine kind of move and shake things for you i mean it moves it a, a little bit I, I i like i had to put a percentage on it uh over the over the weekend uh, on a radio spot and Ooh, it, radio Russ. Yep. Yep. Um, but the, the host had asked me like, what percentage would you give it? And I was like, I, I mean, probably teams probably give it about 10%. So for me, probably three or 4%. I mean, I, I don't get to talk with these players at the, at the combine like they do and, and stuff like that. So I think that's really where the, the high percentage comes in and more so watching the, you know, looking at medicals and exact medicals and stuff like that is very important, but seeing the workouts, it matters. It's part of the process. It's, it's a measuring, a measure, a measuring tool to really see it and, and, and look at it and be like, okay, this guy looks fluid on tape. I'm watching him go through. <laughs> yeah, right. It's that connection. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, but going like, like seeing them go through the motions on the field and through certain drills, it's like, okay, it matches the tape or it doesn't match. He looks like, uh, I'm sorry. Reading the comment. Oh, it's just, I just pull up funny things. Pete had to go and say, I talked it over with my agent. I've decided not to work out of the NFL combine this year. And that's a common theme this year. I, I don't understand why you would even accept the combine invite. If you're not going to work out there. I hate but, that. Like, well, I'm going to go and measure, but I'm not going to do anything. I'm like, just don't go then. Could just measure at your pro day. Right. Exactly. But no, I mean, it, it plays a foot factor. The combine is important. It's a measuring tool. Um, and it, it'll, again, it gives you just kind of clarification of the athletic ability of a player that you're taking. And I think that matters because if you have, and I always use this as an example, Tease Tabor was a, a guy out of Florida that he had really good tape, but he Horrible. came into a scheme in Detroit as a press man corner and he ran like a four, six, seven 40. I think it was actually a four, six, two, and he couldn't recover. Guys would fly by him after they'd get off his jam and he couldn't catch up to him and, and there was no recovery speed there. So I always use that as kind of like a measuring stick with corners. Like if you're running a four, six, two good shot, I'm not drafting you or having you very high. And I'm not one of those guys that I'm like, Oh, this guy was my 50th ranked player. He ran a four, two, five, and now he's my 10th ranked player. It, I don't do these catastrophic jumps up and down the board. It, right. He might move up a couple spots. Um, but again, it just depends on the players around him. Like if the guys in front of him also had a solid combine, there's no reason for me to move that guy up and that guy down. Like mm -hmm. they're, they're still neck and neck. And at the end of the day, the tape is the tape. So I've always been a firm believer in that. Trust the tape. Those three words I live by TTT, um, mm -hmm. or T squared, whatever you want to call it. So I'm a tape guy combine matters, but again, it's just a measuring tool. I think it's, it's it's such an important piece to quantify. I think what you're seeing, like, I like knowing like, man, like this dude's got really great, like change of direction. Okay. Like what does this three cone look like? And pieces like that, or man, like this dude just keeps ghosting everybody like up the field. Like what's his 40. And then it's like, he's running a four, six. Like that's yeah. weird. Is he just not testing? Right. Is it something weird? Or it's like, no man, he ran a four, four, one. You're like that tracks. And that makes sense. I think it's, I think it's useful in terms of quantifying what the tape shows you, which is what I love about advanced. And these aren't advanced metrics, but what I love about advanced metrics in general, like the ability to quantify what you are seeing on the tape and put a number and be able to put things further into perspective. I think it's such a helpful piece for the combine and interviews matter so much. And I also think there's some not like clutch aspect to it, but I think there is something to be said for 
performing amongst the, your peers and the best of the best and trying to show out whether it's like running a 40 or whether it's, you know, that the, I always think of the drill, the receiver drill, where they're just supposed to hold the line and run across and catch and the catch gauntlet. Them. Yeah. But yeah. And so many dudes are always like weaving and drifting mm-hmm. and like that. It, it's, it's not going to deter anyone greatly, but it's such like a little thing to like, when you see someone really hold that line and just bang, bang, bang versus someone who weaves in and out and is unsure of themselves. It's a little thing to be like, Oh, is this guy a little shook right now? Like, especially when you get those two dudes who come up like one yeah. after the other or within like a two or three spot and you know, like they're in that same tier, or they're eyeing one another, like how they perform. It's nice to yep. kind of see um, how everybody stacks up with one another. And again, quantify what you see on tape. I want to address a rumor and shut this down right now. Joe says, and has the Ducks jersey on to indicate that he believes the Bills will take Troy Franklin. I see your game. So, yes, I am wearing an Anaheim Mighty Ducks jersey, a Team Mussolini Anaheim Mighty Ducks jersey. It is not for that reason. I don't, I, I just, I, Troy Franklin is okay. I just think he's why he's been shot to the moon in so many evaluations and talked about as this like complete receiver who can win all over the field and do all these things. And I just disagree with that so hard. He's super fast. And that speed is awesome. Like I'll take a dude who can run like a gazelle, but I just think he's being his and the analysis for what his evaluation is, is just being far too overblown. But again, the speed is awesome. You could coach him up and develop a route tree and all these other things. I'm sure we'll get into that piece as we go forward. But yeah, I want to dispel that, dispel that terrible rumor, Joe, how absolutely dare you. Um, but yeah, the combine is valuable. And I think within that piece, let's start with the wide receivers, Russ, because that's the sexy piece that I think so many Bills fans are focused on and thinking about when it comes to the Buffalo Bills. Gabe Davis is a free agent, probably going elsewhere. Even if he wasn't, I think fans still want a wide receiver. This class is on paper, pretty loaded. It's got a strong top tier, especially with the top three with Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors and Romo Dunze. And then really even like a strong two, depending on how you tier everybody, a strong two, three, four, five. Like you're, you have a chance to get like a quality wide receiver, like true quality back end of like round two going into round three. You can get a useful like wide receiver three with some high like wide receiver two upside potentially going into the fourth round depending on how the board falls. And so we'll start with that wide receiver grouping and who do you think can help themselves the most at this position grouping from somebody in those in that earlier tier, potential day one guy who maybe might be able to propel himself higher into day one, or maybe somebody who's on the fringe day two, day one, and with a good combine can thrust himself firmly into that first round. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, uh, Donnie Mitchell out of Texas and I'm, I'm very much, uh, on that train. I think I'm probably the leader of that hype train. Uh, he, he's a top 25 player for me. I have him ranked ahead of Keon Coleman and I, I look at him just the body control. It felt like whenever teams needed him to have a big catch, he came up mm. with one. Uh, he found ways to get his feet in bounds. He finds the football very well. He can high point the ball and he moves so well for a six foot four, 205 pound receiver, like, or 195 pound receiver. Uh, yeah. I always mix up his size with Marvin Harrison because Harrison's 6'4, 205 and Mitchell 6'4. I've got everybody like the heights and weights. I mix up everybody's all the time. I ha- yeah. constantly have to go back to my notes and make sure I'm not like it. I'll usually yeah. get somewhere in the ballpark of the heights, right? But I'm always like, oh, yeah, he weighs like 185 pounds. And it's like, no, he's 205. And I'm like, why was I so off? Yeah, numbers yeah. Yeah, get me all the time. Yeah. Yeah, but and Mitchell's just one of those guys. He just he does it for me. He moves very well as a as a player for that size in route running, and and we've kind of talked about him. There's games where it's like you're not really running a route, but there's a lot of receivers that are like that. They just they don't run their route when they're not getting the ball, and I think that's becoming a common theme across the league. Um, Not saying that you know that's that's saying the guy's going to be a bust or anything like that. I, I think it can be corrected in the NFL um, or the guy's just not going to see the, not see that, the field. That's a great point though. I feel like this year more than others, there's a good handful of guys in like the top, like the upper tiers where I can tell they're not getting the ball because of mm-hmm. their release off the line, their body language in the stem. Like I can just tell like, Oh, you know, you're not getting the ball. And I feel yeah. like I, I, 
that usually doesn't happen for so many dudes, especially towards the top. If yeah. you like compared to previous years, I mean, Roma Dunze does it. And a lot of it's because he's on the other side of the field and in that offense, everything's thrown outside the numbers. So we already know realistically, he's probably not getting the football because of where the ball's positioned on the hash and, and all that stuff. But um, no, I, I think Adani Mitchell is going to test really well. I, I do. I think, you know, I, I just want to know what his 40 time is going to be. I, that's not the above all be all for me. I mean, I think the three cone drill is going to be well, yeah. uh, but you know, the only time I've ever been able to, or the only, uh, track and field thing that I've been able to uncover on him was the long jump. And he, he jumped, uh, 18, like eighteen six five or something like that. So, uh, not, nothing too, which, which is good, which is not good. I don't know how, if it's that good for a long time. Yeah, no, I, it's, it's, a, it's fine. I mean, it's, it, it, every, everything checks out on that, but it's, it's one of those where it's like, you know, what type of player are we, are we getting, you know, as far as the explosiveness and, and all that. And again, that could have been a, a, a score or a, a measurable from when he was in ninth or 10th grade. I mean, oh, that's the yeah. other thing too. Like some of these guys were on varsity track in ninth and 10th grade yeah, as like a fifth they, grader. Yeah. And then they stopped doing it uh, when they were in 11th and 12th grade. So they could focus on football. So I think it just depends on that, but I, I think he's going to run well, I hope. Um, and and I, I'm just really curious how that turns out. Uh, Romo Dunze. I had a text from uh, somebody yesterday. You got a text and, from Romo Dunze and he was no. like, man, you look like Marty Janetti. <laughs> no, 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 no. We're not going back to the tag. Just making it all up. <laughs> uh, he he knows I'm the heart. He knows I'm Mr. WrestleMania. He knows. No way. No way. Um, but Roma Dunze, he ran a hundred meter dash in high school in 10.65 seconds. So mm. that should translate to a sub four, four time. And I mean, that's saying something when you're six foot three, 215 yeah. pounds, like for the bill's sake, he probably wasn't going to be there anyways, but let's say they get, they get frisky. They want to trade up if they like, like, let's say you were doing a mock draft simulator and he's sitting there at 12 or 13 and you try to trade up and you try to get him. Realistically, I don't know if that's going to happen. If he runs a, a sub four, four or a potential four, three, five, like there, there's some good confirmation. And like Jalen Waddle ran a 10, a 10, six, eight hundred meter dash. So, you know, three tenths of a second faster. We'll, we'll kind of see what happens. So, so a is going to move, um, some other like just out of the top tier guys, you know, I'm really curious with Xavier Worthy, how the medical is going to test. I mean, he flies a 10, five, 500 meter dash. I'm not trying to, you know, steal anything that you're, I know that's your guy. So I don't want to steal. Oh the no, but you're, but you're all, I'm not, I don't have the track numbers. I know that's your thing. So I, yeah, no. And I mean, he ran a 10, five, five it's, it's, he flies. Uh, my biggest concern with Xavier Worthy, and I think maybe we can dive into him just as his overall evaluation. Cause I know you're a fan. I love the blazing speed. I love what he can present after the catch, the vertical threat ability, but he's got the lower body injury with like his ankle and foot that was banged up earlier this year. Lower body extremities just always worry me because they tend to flare back up down the road. But like, it wouldn't surprise me if he pulled a lot of like Hollywood Brown pro comparisons. And, um, you know, I can pull up Holly, Hollywood Brown's um, pro day or uh, combine numbers and all that. But, um, yeah, I, I I don't know. I think Xavier Worthy is going to test really well. Um, a Donnie Mitchell and and then um, yeah, I mean Roma Dunze. Those are kind of the top three guys for me. I'll, I'll start with Worthy. Um, kind of, I have some pieces on Mitchell too because I, I really like him as well. He's a there's and actually I'll, actually I'm going to get into this point in a minute because there's so many pieces of, for what I was about to say. I I do think yeah, Worthy's going to test really well and show well in that forty. I think he's a dude you're looking at like. I don't know. He could probably, I feel like he's going to run in like the high four threes. Like I could see him popping out like a four, three, nine, a four, three, eight. He intrigues me so much. He's my wide receiver four, and it's the speed with the route running precision that he operates with. Like, and being able to run these, the routes that he runs, he runs like everything at full speed. Like he attacks leverage. He attacks cushion. Like when that ball is snapped, he comes out of the gates hot. It, and it's so funny to see him and Mitchell on the field at the same time. Cause it'll be like the ball is snapped and Mitchell's running or I'm a worthy's running. Like he owes rent money and it's due. And Mitchell's just yeah. like, la, 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 like off the line, <laughs> just like not a care in the world. And yeah. I just love his pace and what he does and, and and how he can get vertical. He can defeat press with suddenness and his hands. And even though he runs, 
everything full speed. And he's, oh, he's got this one cut. I forget who it was against. Um, I called it like a Tokyo drift cut. It's just like an out, like a deep out, but he runs it full speed. And then when he hits the brake, he leans and like drags his hand, like on the ground to balance himself and just comes out and separates. And even within that, He's got acceleration and deceleration in and out of his brakes. My biggest question with him, I do have some injury concern pieces. He's gotten better with the drops, but I still think like the drop issue is less than ideal for him. Mm -hmm. And then I do wonder for as much as I like him, 6'1", 172 pounds. Even though last year I banged the table for Tank Dell, Jordan Addison was my wide receiver one. I believe Jordan Addison was your wide receiver one as well. And right. Yeah. And Jordan Addison was a, tiny guy as well, especially for a wide receiver one, both of those guys, even Josh Downs as well, his performance in Indianapolis, which I think flew under the radar as a rookie. Those guys gave me more confidence in smaller frames, smaller bodied wide receivers, being able to not only succeed in the NFL, but being able to succeed early on and potentially in their rookie year. So that gives me a little more confidence in having him be a wide receiver for, for me, but it does concern me a little bit again, like the drop stuff, which he has gotten better. And a lot of his drops come underneath like, um, Eric Turner, uh, from cover one, put out a good tweet earlier today. I think it was him. Um, then like most of his drops are coming to the one to 10 yard area. Like he doesn't really drop anything downfield. And that's another thing I love about him too. The ball tracking ability, just what he can do. I think his tape is so strong from a technical perspective and from a speed perspective. And then if he comes out and shows out at the combine, I a combine, I think he could really propel himself solidly yeah. into the first round. A similar guy, um, Brian Thomas Jr. from LSU, who I'm kind of iffy on overall as like a prospect. I just don't. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I think you kind of get what you get with him, which is like, I don't want to like simplify it, but like big guy runs fast. Like yeah. he's six foot four. He's over 200 pounds. He's flies. If he runs, I don't know if he runs a sub four, four or a low four, four forty, that becomes extremely intriguing. He, and he starts that conversation for me with this tier guy. So for me, and I put out a tweet about it earlier this week, my tiers are Mar- I have Marvin Harrison jr. And Malik neighbors in tier one together. MVH mm-hmm. is one neighbors is two. I have Roma Dunze in his own tier. So Roma Dunze is tier two by himself. Then I've got worthy in tier three as wide receiver four. And then tier that tier right after, there's so many guys that I feel the combine could go a long way in helping them separate the the Mitchells, the Keon Coleman's, the Xavier Leggett's, the Brian Thomas Juniors, the Troy Franklins. Like I think if Franklin comes out and runs like a four three two forty or something wild, maybe that propels him a little forward. If Brian Thomas again at his size and frame comes out, his ability to high point the football and extend and win with that physicality at the catch point. If he's running a sub four four, Keon Coleman can really sink his ship or potentially buoy it a little bit with a strong yeah. combine with the athleticism and size and frame and ability to high point the football. That's where the conversation gets really interesting for me and then even going to the back end too like what does Jalen Polk do what does Jalen McMillan do what does Javon Baker do or how fast does Taj Washington or Malik Washington run like those kind of guys in day three but it's that it's that day two kind of breaking into day one tier with the Mitchells and the Coleman's and the Thomases and the Franklin's and I don't know like you and I, not, not, neither of us loved what Xavier Leggett did at the Senior Bowl, but he's cut up. He looks like a baby A.J. Brown. If he comes out and runs like a 4 4 40 at like 220-something pounds, he's going to jump out of the gym. He's going to yep. bench really well. Like he is that. He's the Vernon Davis of this year's combine where he's going to look great in shorts and he's going to show out in every drill. Yeah. Do people see that one year of production and think, man, you know what? He's on the come up. We can tap into that. Look how he tested. Boom. Yeah. You can I feel like you can say that for him and really a bunch of other guys in those tiers. That back end of round one into the middle of round two, I think is so interesting for the receivers. Yeah. And I think the combine can go a long way in terms of settling some of that dust. No, I'm with you. And like you mentioned the drops with Xavier Worthy. So I, I want to go back to him real quick because mm-hmm. the, the key thing there was, you know, I think it was like eleven or twelve drops in the one to ten yard range. And it's like I'm, I'm going to take this guy to, at, you know, let's say six foot, 175 pounds. I'm not going to always put him as an X receiver. He's going to play in the slot for me. Yeah, slot is he gonna, yeah. Is, is he going to win in the short and intermediate areas of the field consistently enough where I can trust him to catch the ball mm-hmm. first and foremost, that's big. 
And if he can't do that, and I don't have that trust, now what is he going to be for me? Is he only going to be a deep threat? Is he only, what is he for me? Like, that's where I struggle with because the drops are a concern. Yeah. But uh, you mentioned Keon Coleman. The, the only reason why I'm off on him a little bit is just, I I, I don't I, I don't know if it's because, like, watching him at Michigan State and seeing the <laughs> usage, like, the usage was just so asinine. And then I watched him at Florida State and, like, there was some games where he just popped all the time. And then there was games where like we talk about route running and like no usage. It's ugly. And it's ugly. And then like I, I look into times and like when he was a senior in high school, his PR for the hundred meter dash was eleven point seven six seconds. And like Oof. if I throw that in if I throw that into the converter, like just doing that right now, it's a, it's a four nine. Like that's what they convert it to. <laughs> that's so bad. It, like that's it's terrible, and I, and I get it. Like there's so much that goes into a hundred meter dash, and that's not the above all be all. Like what right, was right. his time between you know zero yards and forty? Yeah. So like I, I just I struggle with that. I don't know like how well he's going to test. Again, he might blow it up and run a four three five. I have no idea. I don't think he's going to. He doesn't look like that type of guy. He looks like a build up receiver. So that's I cool. just I struggle with Keon. Um, but you got into some day three names there, late day two names. And Jalen Polk, I'm so intrigued with because I think he's going to test really well. I yep. really do. And health is a big concern with him. Injury history is a big concern. I'm a fan of him. I think he's a, a top 75 player in this draft. I think you could take him in the back end of the second round and be just fine. Um, I could see him going even sooner. I mean, I, I don't have a recorded 100-meter dash for him, but 200-meter dash time was 22.89. So, I mean, that's, that's flying, um, yeah. for anybody out there. I mean, going 200 meters, that's flying. Um, but no, I just, I, I like Jalen Polk's game a lot, um, as kind of like that slot receiver motion guy. I think if he landed in a place like San Francisco, LA, mm -hmm. we talked about, I talked with you about Troy Franklin on that. Yes. Um, and, and I want to get into Troy Franklin in a second, but like with Polk, I just, I think if you get him in motion and you kind of get him out in space and get some, you know, a big body in front of him, I think he can do some damage. Um, and, and I feel kind of the same way with Troy Franklin. I think mm -hmm. he plays obviously with better body control than Polk. He's obviously bigger. Um, one of those types of players though, I think if, if he's, if he doesn't add any type of muscle or any type of weight to his frame, I think he's going to struggle with physical defenders consistently at the catch point. And like so much of his game at times was like, back shoulder catches and like mm -hmm. making these great adjustments and like he, he runs where he's where he's got like 10 yards of separation because he just flew by everybody trying to cover him exactly and i'm just like if you're playing against a team that can run like really good quarters coverage i don't know if that's going to work for you if uh, you know if you got a too high shell is that guy is that safety going to be able to get over the top on you it's very possible especially if you have a quarterback that you know doesn't throw it on a rope and mm. I, I don't know. I, I just struggle with Troy Franklin. I think he's more of like closer to 35, 40 range rather than like top 25. I, mm -hmm. I think that's a little bit more respectable. So I don't know. I, I don't know um, who's going to really show out outside of like Roma Dunze and Xavier Worthy on the 40. Um, I think the rest of it, you know, three cone drill and stuff, you just got to see how it goes. I, I think the winner of probably the three code, three cone drill is going to probably be uh, Lad McConkey. I mean, if we oh, want to yeah. talk about route running, he's, he might be the best route runner in the class. I honestly, I, I completely it, agree. He, he is already like a professional route runner. Route I, I, Oh, you and I were texting yesterday about it. Um, I put out that clip and he doesn't get the ball. He's just running a go against Tennessee. And you, I, and maybe this is, and no, I'm, I was, I was gonna say like, maybe it's cause I don't watch enough film. I watch a ton of film. I don't think I've ever seen someone use a rocker step in their stem for a go route to beat somebody vertical. Like I just hadn't seen that. And he just, I was like, Oh, and obviously he stood out at the senior bowl and on tape for us, you know, going into the senior bowl, but yeah, he's just such a professional route runner already. And he's somebody too, who I think, and I think it's because of, certain uh demographic pieces that he hits but everybody's like man like great slot receiver like man the next hunter renfro and all this stuff like i think he can win on the outside given his route running given his releases and how precise he is in his movements he's another interesting one i'm, I'm interested to in. him and like the kind of the guys that are like build as slot guys but i think could also do things on the outside like mcconkey like ricky pearsall i'm interested to see how they test um i also to kind of bring it back to your 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 first dude you know 
with Mitchell, his his flexibility and like the, how pliable he is, I find really interesting. Like his movements, he's not the sharpest or the most sudden like route runner. He's not this just precise. Again, it's so awesome watching him and Xavier Worthy on the same field because they're a great juxtaposition with one another. But he's just so explosive and flexible. Like you watch him in a break and his ability to sink his hips or have that ankle flexion, it's almost like he uses it like a recoil. Like he bends and then snaps out of it. Like you watch him run just like a simple slant and the stem isn't anything great. And he looks like he's running it at like 40%. Yeah. And then he puts his foot in the ground and he creates like six yards of separation just off of the push off because he yep. stabs that foot in the ground and it's boom out of the break. He's an, a, a one for me too, that I watched the ball tracking downfield and the hands and the catch radius and how smooth and fluid he makes everything look. He's one who I think, I, I think could test well and firmly entrench himself in that round one conversation because yeah. like he's one too, that gauntlet drill, he's going to do amazing. The hands, yep. he's going to hold that line. It's going to be pretty and smooth. You're barely going to hear a noise when the ball touches his hands. And it's just going to look like he's just out there being like, what else? What yeah. next? I'm bored. Like, well, he's, he, I think he could really show out in that regard and cement himself. Yeah. And I, I think he could be, a, again, a, we, we circle this around the bills. I, I know people are going to be, and I've seen the comments in here, like people don't want you to trade up for a guy in the first round. And I understand that. But like, if you have a guy that's going to make your team better, if they moved up to like 19 or 20 to get a Donnie Mitchell, I, I, I think that's a win. I really do. I think that makes your team better pairing them up with Stefan Diggs. We've seen what we saw with Khalil Shakur, uh, Khalil Shakir. Mm -hmm. You have Dawson Knox, you, you, uh, have Dalton Kincaid, like I, a six foot four guy makes it, it makes a difference, man. And he moves like a yes. five foot nine guy. Like it's, and you also got to think too, the thing I keep putting into, I, and I've said it on the show last week and multiple other shows that I've been on. Sorry. I've done like a, a bunch of guest spots the last like two weeks. And so everything is like going in my brain. Um, I, mean, I think I did say in this guy's coverage, whoever the bills draft, say they draft a receiver in the first round, right. To be like quote unquote wide receiver two. He's not going to be target two. target. One is Stefan Diggs. Target two is Dalton Kincaid. Target three might even be Khalil Shakir, but also factoring in how good the Bills' run game is and what Joe Brady likes to do in the run, combined with using running backs out of the backfield, James Cook is probably target, at the very least, touch person number three. So yeah. I feel like at best, even if you draft a wide receiver in round one, they're probably, in terms of touches, option four coming out of this year because it's going to be Diggs, Kincaid, Cook, and then this receiver, which is what makes it intriguing to me with someone like a Worthy who's such a field stretcher, even Troy Franklin, but Mitchell as well because he adds an element in the receiver room you don't have, which is size, the ability to high point the football, and basically play above the rim and play big boy football downfield. And then you take the juice that he has and the athleticism and the natural ability that he has – and you let him lean into those in year one while you coach up that professional route running aspect to him. So by mm -hmm. the time, whenever Stefan Diggs leaves, Mitchell's ready to be your number one because he's got the size, he's got the frame. He can be an X receiver or you can move him around and have him be a little bit of a power slot. Like you want to do some fun stuff? Cool. Put him in yeah. the slot next to Stefan Diggs and throw some slot fades his way and let's see him up against that nickel yeah. or up against the safety. Like, and then – or imagine too, like you're putting Mitchell on the backside as the X receiver because to the trip side, you've got Dalton Kincaid, Stefan Diggs, and Khalil Shakir. Cool. What is your what does the corner two look like? Do they have the size yeah. or the speed or the physicality to match up with Mitchell? Because that's an easy one-on-one -on -one bucket, depending on what kind of team you're playing against. And that's where again all these fits and schematics start to get really interesting. That's also too why. I don't love Brian Thomas, but I can understand the fit for Brian Thomas there with the Bills because you put him on that backside as the X receiver by himself and just say, again, not to simplify his game, but be like, hey, bro, go run real fast downfield. Allen's going to chuck it up to you. Just go out, jump who's ever downfield. And he's probably like, okay, I can do that. Like, yeah. it's just so intriguing. Well, you know, getting away from – I'm with you. I, I, I would be so intrigued to see what that looks like just because I think there's so much – upside and versatility with everything that you have uh, as far as you know formations uh, production mm -hmm. and 
and obviously just development. And then obviously everything that goes into Josh Allen, right? Like it just makes him a better quarterback. And that's what yeah. it's about making him better. So he can get over the hump and get this team over the hump. And, and obviously competing with guys like Mahomes and Burrow and, and Lamar and stuff like that in this, in this conference. But I look at, and I didn't bring him up yet. Jermaine Burton, Alabama. Oh, bro. I, so you talked, my- you ahead. talked about him to me. Oh yes. Like two weeks ago. And I finally like started diving in a little bit and I'm like, man, the this tape, guy, bro. he has some solid tape. I don't know how he's going to test, but I think fluidity wise and the vert, like the vertical ability from him is something else, but the, he's going to sp- run fast. I feel like, I think he's going to run in the, I could see him being a sneaky guy to push like low four fours. Yes. And I think he's going to push into that potential back end of the second round conversation. Same way I feel about like Jalen Polk, same way I feel about Jermaine Burton. I think there's some, some really talented receivers. I think it's a deep class. Um, So I I think that's why maybe the bills don't force their hand in the first round. Unless again, there's a guy that they really like, like an Adani Mitchell or maybe Keon Coleman. But I I just Jermaine Burton, man, I'm so curious how he's going to test. And I, 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 he didn't run track and field. So I don't know, um, but he looks fast. I mean, he looks like he can fly. And he's got good, I mean, we'll see what he measures in at the combine, but he's listed at six foot, 194 pounds. Like, he's got good He size. takes some shots, dude. He takes some shots. And he plays, so here's the thing that scares me a little bit for the Bills with him. I know there are some, like, potential character stuff. Like, I know the stuff that happened after the Tennessee game where he, like, hit a fan or did something and – I know how much like trash he talked to the Georgia fans after they beat him. But some of that, like on the field, I like, like he plays with such an edge. The, the Texas A&M tape is the game I started with. And he, it's like the first or second drive. And he runs like a, an out on like second down or third down right at the sticks. And the corner breaks it up and knocks it out of his hands. And every time for the entire rest of the game that Burton makes any kind of catch on that corner, he is barking at him and letting him know what's good. Like it was like a personal vendetta. Like he got that PBU and Burton was just like, you're dead for the whole rest of this game. Any catch that he's making, he is gunning him. And the edge that he plays with the tenacity, he plays with the physicality. He's got a route where uh, they do like a switch release and he takes an inside, he takes an inside release. Corners literally grabbing him and pulling his arm back and Burton dips and just shakes the hell out of him and then gets on the out and like the dude corner falls to the ground. Burton's wide open. Then of course gets up talks like he can sink his hips. He's got a nasty rocker step. He can sell Mm -hmm. vertical and snap it off. Like I could watch him run a five yard hitch all day. He'll stem that outside and get you to turn. If especially if you're playing bail, you're a bail type of technique team. He'll try, he'll work into that blind spot. And then when he snaps it off, it's a quick, he'll get that first, that long step, sink that hip. And then it's Mm -hmm. one more and he's turning and he's snatching it. Like, yeah. And I would like to see him use some more deception in his stems in general, but the physicality, he's got athleticism down the field. He can high point the football. I love your point as well of like waiting past the first round after the bills for a wide receiver. I recognize the talent pool that could potentially be there. I just think the second and third round are loaded with wide mm. receiver talent. And granted, a lot of the bills holes on the roster are going to get, filled as we go forward in free agency they're not going to go into the draft having only six defensive linemen on the roster and having a big hole at safety and not having a true wide receiver too they're going to like bring in reinforcements so they can go best player available and all that but the wide receiver pool is just so deep from a schematic usage perspective and we haven't even gotten into somebody who like I really like like Javon Baker who I talked about going into the senior bowl talked about him coming out like he's somebody who I think Oh yeah. Thrash from Louisville. Like there's so we're doing like er, the other Jalen from Washington, Jalen McMillan. I also like, I put a clip out earlier. 2022 Jalen McMillan was nasty this year. He was a bit hurt for Washington, which is what helped Jalen Polk become more than number two in Washington. But 2022 Jalen McMillan, if anybody wants to see go, I, I put up some stuff against Oregon. He's high pointing the football downfield against Christian Gonzalez and ripping it away from him on like a 50 yard post. And he's running choice yeah. routes and crossing dudes up and breaking ankles. Like, oh, as JG says, you got Malachi Corley. Like, there's all these options 
in this draft. Again, somebody I, I like Javon Baker because of the skill. Roman set. Wilson. <laughs> I forgot Roman Wilson, who was probably the like the arguably the best senior bowl performer when we were down yeah. there in Mobile earlier this month. Like there are so many dudes that again, where they go and where they fall will be based upon what a team is looking for in that skill set. I think it's similar to kind of I think the good example to use is like a microcosm for it is Jackson Smith and Jigba last year, who was a great wide receiver, but unless you needed a slot receiver, you didn't really care about Jackson Smith and Jigba. So it was like, oh, well, he's arguably like, he might be wide receiver one ahead, ahead of Jordan Addison. But then it was like, yeah, but do you need a slot receiver? If not, then he's not going to be high up on your board. And there's so many receivers that based on their skill set and frame, as we have every year, but I feel like especially this year, will really determine where these guys go because you've got all you've got all these guys jumbled together in these back end of round one into round two tiers. And even really the day two creeping into late day one tiers because there's so many dudes. Varying frames, sizes, skill sets, route running prowess, all that stuff. The combine again, I think can go a long way towards being like, well, we had similar grades on this, on these two dudes. One of them ran a four four two. The other one ran a four five five. So maybe yeah. we take the guy who's dude, a four four two. Dude, Roman Wilson ran a ten eight six as a freshman. Damn, really? In the hundred meter dash as a freshman, and, he, and and he's a dude that will route you up. So imagine if he comes out and runs, I don't know, like a four a four, four, five, a four three five, yeah, right, or four three. For, for imagine if he runs at four three, like uh, all of a sudden we're getting into into, into a yeah. conversation piece where it's like, okay, thicker frame toughness, yep. long speed, route running yep. ability, pedigree with, you know, being at Michigan multiple years, like where does he slot in? Like, oh, well, yeah. man, it's just so many dudes to have a conversation about. I know, dude. I, I will just end it on this on wide receiver because I know we have other position groups, but Jamari Thrash for me is a is a just a I, – I loved what he did at the senior He had a board. fun week at senior boy, yeah. The pacing of his routes, like he might not be a blazer. He might run a – Four or five. He might do um, a six, eight, five in the three cone, which is perfect. Uh, it's not, I don't know. I don't know. I can't remember what the threshold is for receivers in the. In the I have cone. to look it up every year for the three cone to be like, oh, this is what so and so's time is. I'm yeah. like, is that good? And I have to go and look it up. Yeah. You have to look at the percentile yep, and all yep, that. Yep, yep, and, yep, yep. Um, but it it's one of those where it's like, and I don't like always predicting and, and like, I'll make a couple bets on the over and the under on certain guys, but that's about it. I'm going to make a lot of bets on anything. You have a problem. I won $50 on the, on the wings winning today. Thank you. Dylan okay. for scoring a goal. Um, they, they won eight to three, by the way. Um, well, good for you. That's yeah. We're nice. winning the cup. We're winning the cup. I got, you know, I got it, ducks over as, me. as long as one of the teams I really hate don't win it. Sure. Go ahead. Do your thing, Detroit. That's fair. Um, but no, yeah, Jamari Thrash, I'm just so intrigued with. I mean, great size for a guy that can play inside, outside. Great pacing within his routes. He can high point the football. Yeah. Um, he gets his head around on the ball, whether it's a back shoulder throw or whether it's just one that's, you know, you, you got to high point it and get it. Uh, I, I thought he had a great week at the Senior Bowl. I, I'm so intrigued by him. And I see stuff like mock draft simulators. He's at like pick 115 or something. And I'm like, I don't think he's going to be there, man. I really the, simu think the simulators this early are like wild. Like there's dudes that are falling. Someone's like, oh, I can't believe you took so-and-so this yeah. early when you could have just waited till round four and got so-and-so. I'm like, because that's not how the board is going to fall. Like your simulator is wonky. Right. Yeah, no. So I like Thrash. I, there, like you said, there's so many guys. It's hard to pinpoint which one fits the bills because you can probably take five or six guys and be like, yeah, they all like these guys all make sense. So yes. no, not the son of James Thrash. That was the first thing that I thought of because like, what are the, like, I've never heard of another person in life having a last name thrash. Yeah. And then I was like, this dude is also a wide receiver. It's gotta be, but it wasn't. I also, I keep telling this, I've watched so much USC football. Cause I always like stay up late on Saturdays. I'm watching pac 12 stuff. Well, whatever they are. And now, I had no idea Brendan Rice was Jerry Rice's kid. You didn't know that at Senior Bowl? Until the Senior Bowl. Eric oh, okay. said it. Eric said it. And like I laughed and he was like, no, seriously. And I was like, Jerry Rice is his dad? Like I had no idea. <laughs> like I no idea. What's Jerry Rice is his dad? Uh, and even him, like he's got some fun aspects at his size and frame if you want like a true X type. Of, and, and even yeah. again, his partner in crime there, a bit at USC. Like, it, yeah, bro. Like tiny jitterbug dude flies and for a guy who's on the smaller end 
he's running seam routes and he's going up and getting it. He plays like he's 6'2", 215 pounds. And he yeah. is not 6'2", 250 no. pounds. He a little guy. like And just what he does and how he attacks the ball. And he's a dude. Oh, you want an easy like 15 yards on a tunnel screen or a little bubble? Cool. Kick it. Just spit it out to Tosh Washington real quick. And that's another yeah. aspect too. Like if you're the Bills, like, cool. Do you get a Javon Baker or someone in the second round who offers you more of like a true X potential, or again, maybe you go in the first and you take Mitchell or you take Brian Thomas or something like that. And then you just want somebody who, I don't know, is fast as hell. So you're like, you know what? I'm on pure speed. Let's get Taj Washington. Or, yeah. you know, even you like mm-hmm. some run after catch mixed with speed and you take Malik Washington from Virginia. Like there's so many options. Yeah. In Malik Washington, another name. Yeah. Yep. Like Dude, there's, there's so many. many, everybody with Washington attached to them. So you got Malik Washington, Taj Washington. Then you've got the three Washington Husky wide receivers, like anybody associated. And then even, I mean, Curtis Samuel's a free agent now. The three Washington commanders receivers were sick with Samuel and, and uh, Dotson and Terry McLaurin. It seems like anybody associated with the word Washington is sick. Would you like to see Curtis Samuel in Buffalo? Not for what I think he's going to cost and for okay. how he's probably going to be. I just think they could go and get a more cost effective option in the draft and pair things together with um free agency. Again, I like Curtis Samuel and I like what he brings. My thought with anybody for wide receiver two, again, is wide receiver two on the depth chart, but at best they're going to be touch four. Yeah. And that and that doesn't even factor in Josh Allen running the ball and doing stuff. So technically you're like touch five. So yeah. I'm not going to pay some I'm not going to pay a receiver double digit and average annual value to be option five or four, depending on how you're looking at it in the offense. Right. And especially too, if he's not the long-term solution to a true number one, or if Stefan Diggs gets super disgruntled in two years and you got to ship him out. And then again, too, even with how this draft is like this wide receiver grouping, I think is, is so fun. The combine is going to be awesome to watch the wide receivers, just to see the forties and the three cones and, get official measurables, watch the gauntlet drill, watch them pair with these quarterbacks and see how they do downfield and running all the routes that we saw. Like I just remember Josh Downs showing out last year with uh, how he was running his stems and individual and, and everything like that. And I, I think the combine will do some moving and shaking with those day two wide receivers that can get pushed up earlier into day two or day one or get pushed down into the back end of day two. Because again, there are so many there's so many options in this pool that you want to use every type of quantifiable piece you can to kind of filter things out. I'm very excited. We really could just do like literally probably like a four hour thing, just talking about receivers and probably talk about like 25 wide receivers and get into the weeds because and they're, they'd all be quality. We wouldn't be talking about them just to talk about them. Like, yeah, man, it's a fun conversation. Also a fun conversation. Well, depending on how you view it, defensive tackle. Another position of need for the oh I, I shouldn't even mention him I let me let me stop. Charles says how about Rosemi Jack Saint day two? He's somebody I texted you about. I can't believe I forgot to put him in. Oh here. yeah, that's your boy, Marcus Rosemi Jack Saint. I loved him at the scene and loved. I liked him a lot at the Senior Bowl. I liked his tape this week, and he's he's in that Lad McConkey boat where like. It's not Brock Bowers, so you're not seeing like a ton. And Georgia runs the ball a ton. When they pass it, they go to Bowers. And then between injuries for McConkey, he's in and out. But like, there's not a ton of games where there's like a ton of targets for McConkey. It's the same thing with Rosemey Jackson. But what he does, like the size, the physicality, the athleticism, he's got tremendous hands. 105 career targets, only two drops. Both of those drops came in 2021, no drops in 2022, no drops in 2023. He's making off frame catches. He plucks the ball out of the air. Um, I have his notes on another page that is not in front. I have a handwritten notes that aren't in front of me right now. So I'm not reading off that. I'm just going yeah. off of memory. He's a dude who flashed me at the senior bowl. He's somebody who I like on day three. He's also it, like, I feel like an X receiver type that you can get on day three, use his size and speed and route running like, you watch him swipe dude's hands on his release. He looks like a defensive lineman turning the arc. Like he's he's got a lot of pieces I like as well. He made some tough grabs against uh, Missouri in in that Missouri game. Like mm. he has one where like Chris Abrams' drain is all over him. He comes up with it. He makes one catch like over the middle on like a deep post or something like that. Yep, like yep. he man, he just he continued to pop and it, like you mentioned him and I was like, all right, I got to watch this guy between now and the draft. 
but I've watched so much Georgia stuff from Cedric Van Pran, the off the center, Amarius Mims, uh, Dewan Edwards. Edwards, who's my boy. Uh, obviously McConkey at Bowers. Like they're, I, I've watched it all so much. I'm like, all right, I got to take a break, but I'm, I'm going to get to him. And I, I'm excited because he is, he's a lot of fun. He's phenomenal. Oh, what up Silas Silas. Uh, I haven't seen you in a while here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the super chat. And Silas says Saint has some of the best hands in traffic. He absolutely does. And I found mm-hmm. a, a bunch of my notes for him. He's already, he's one of the best blocking receivers in the draft. He might be the best one, very willing blocker, physical and effective. Um, and you can have him be an effective blocker in space or attached to the formation. You can use him on those kind of like Y insert type of looks where you can have, like you want to run duo and have him insert and fit up on the safety or the nickel. Beautiful. Yeah. You want to have him like crack down on an edge real quick too. Like he'll do it. He's out there burying like safeties in space that are like around 200 pounds. It's beautiful. Um, he's able to make cuts at full speed. He snaps off his routes. Again, I mentioned the hands. He's a long strider, but he still has some suddenness to him in his breaks, even though he is a long strider. Not a ton of wiggle or, you know, juice after the catch. He's not a big, like, make people miss kind of guy. Um, attacks the DB's cushion, and he has a good feel for where passing windows are underneath and in the intermediate. And if we wanted to look up what his measurables are, oh, I should actually probably pull up um, the senior bowl numbers, but I'm just going to – he's listed at 6'2", 195 pounds. So if he comes in, I think he could run – I don't know, like a low four five or a high four four type of forty. If he comes in anywhere like a four four eight to a four five two, I'm cool with that at six foot two, almost two hundred pounds. At the senior bowl, he checked in at six one two oh five with thirty three okay. and an eighth inch arms. So okay. not bad. He's longer than some guards out there. Let's just put it that way. He's yeah, he's got longer arms than Jordan Morgan, the offensive tackle, potential from interior Arizona. offensive lineman from Arizona. And I and I like the weight more than I do. Give me somebody over six foot. I don't care if you're six one and above. I love. Give me over pounds and pounds. you move like that though. Yes. And you block and you're physical. It's all right. He's a Detroit Lion. It's all good. Oh, stop doing that. If anybody wants more on him, literally just go into Twitter and type Pro Ant Jack Saint, and you're probably gonna see like ten clips from yesterday alone. Yeah, he's another dude. I can't believe. Thank you so much, Charles, for mentioning that. Yeah, I he's a dude who I really really like. And again, he's on day three. Like I, I think. Well, maybe as he not, again, he, I, maybe he's. That's day what two. we think. That's what we think. But he could be a. He could be the Bills' pick in the second round. You don't know, man. Like these there's two. so many. I like him late. Like just like I originally liked Javon Baker late, and it reminds me of last year how much I liked Jonathan Mingo, and then came draft time, it was like, oh, he went in the second round. Yep. Like he had a good senior bowl and his size and frame and speed. And people were like, nope, we're betting on the trades. Here we go. Second round. Well, it's the same thing with defensive tackles. I know we're going to talk about them here. And it's like, you look at Johnny Newton and um, Byron Murphy. Yeah. Those two guys, I think are the clear cut best interior defensive linemen of the class. Yes. And then there's just a drop off. And like, I don't Big think I'm right. And I don't think we, I per, yeah, I don't think we see another defensive tackle for probably, maybe 20 picks, maybe 30 picks. Who is your, uh, so as we start to get into this defensive tackle conversation, who is your defensive tackle three? Like after, so who's your one? Is it Murphy or is it Newton? Uh, Newton. It's it's close. I mean, it's, we're talking fractions of a point, but it's Newton and then Murphy. My problem with Murphy is I think his pad level rises too consistently against uh, double teams. I also yeah. think, um, he, I, I just, I, I think he gets just kind of content there. I think playing next to a 362 pound defensive tackle into Fondre Sweat is a big benefit, and it got him into a lot of one on one situations. They used him situationally, which was very odd. I like if you're as uh, just an absolute dog, like I feel like you should be out there more than I, at times. Like they would, like they'd be playing, uh, let's say Alabama, and Alabama would be driving down the field and Murphy's not on the field. And then all of a sudden they get into the red zone and Murphy's now on the field. And I get why like teams do that, but, and, and I understand he's going to, he's going to, he's going to blow the doors off the combine in the next couple of days. He's going to test really well at six, one, three Oh eight. He but pulled out of the just, senior bowl literally the night before first practice. Cause he probably got wind that he's going in the top 20 or top half of the first round. Yeah, and like in his game is is very similar to guys that we see in the NFL, like quick hands, like Kenny Clark, and mm-hmm. he's able to fight pressure with pressure. But combo blocks, double teams, 
playing next to a 362 pound tackle. It, it just, <laughs> it, I just worry about that. But again, I still really like him. Johnny Newton playing through injury, always on the go. So explosive. He's the a fact freak. that he, that tape that like him against Wisconsin was a just, he balled out the whole yeah. game and he did it on a fractured foot. He had a Jones fracture in his foot. Yeah. And he's out there ghosting anybody and everybody along the entire yeah. offensive line. Yeah. And I think he's going to go down the board a little bit. I think, you know, again, he, I think he's going to be very much in play for Buffalo and Detroit. And I mentioned him because we're neck and we're right after each other on the draft board. Mm. And it's no secret I'm a Lions guy. So like I think either <laughs> I, I think either one makes a lot of sense for us. Yeah. Um the the next guy ha- oh, how do you have him? The and I know that, you gotta give some love to Silas real quick too. I did, yeah. Pulled up this uh I, I, I was gonna say Silas, I haven't gotten into Zakari Franklin yet, um, with how deep that wide receiver yeah, he plus yeah. he didn't have anything. I wanna feel like he only but I was banged up in 2023. I, let me pull up my notes. Yeah, he only had four games in 2023. Um, eight total targets. Yeah, he played against Bama, LSU, and Auburn, but only eight targets uh, amongst everything in those games. I'd have to go back and, yeah, see his uh, Texas San Antonio stuff from 2022 and 2021. Um, just haven't gotten to him to that point. But awesome name to bring up. Silas is always, like, trying, like, these obscure, like, pieces that he loves – um, and actually a bunch of them have hit. Yeah. Also oh, hamstring. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. But we will get to him at some point. So I was like, again, appreciate the super chat and you being here. Um, the defensive tackle t- conversation is tough. My, the reason I have Murphy ahead of Newton is I think there's more positional versatility. Like I think he mm-hmm. can three tech and he can one tech. Whereas Newton, I feel like I really just want him as a three tech yeah. more so than I want him banging. You know, what's weird too. Like, He's listed at 295, but he looks like he weighs 305 or like yeah. 310. Like I would have never thought he was sub 300 um watching how big he is on tape. But I really didn't think I posted like the first my first clip of Newton and somebody commented and was like, "Oh man, like who do you have? Like Newton or Murphy number 1?" And I was like, "Well, I've just started Newton." So I can't comment and I was like, "But it's going to be really hard for someone to, you know, surpass Byron Murphy for me." And here I am thinking that Newton like could do it just with what he does, like the violence in the hands, the pop in those hands, like everything that he has, the swim move, the swipe chop into the rip. Like you can also depend on two. If like you're an odd front team, like you want to play him in a four eye. I yeah. really, really like that. And with his quickness and lateral agility and explosion on the snap, the games that you can play with run stunts and all these different aspects, like he can jump two gaps in an instant just because of the lateral agility and explosion that he has, let alone the hand usage. He's violent. He's mean. He's nasty. When I say violent, I mean like the pop and the quickness in his hands when he swims or when he swipes, but also violent with how he lays quarterbacks the F out. Like he puts them in the dirt and Mm -hmm. You know, he bangs, he gums up the works against the run. Just, I, I, I like so much of what Newton does. Both of them have first round grades for me um, mm-hmm. with what they can do. And I, I probably will flip flop a ton on both of them thinking yeah. who's like one versus who's two. Like yeah, it might, they, they might get into like a one, a one B situation for me, like camp mm-hmm. kitchens and Tyler Newman at safety. Yeah. It, it's almost like you have to tear those ones off and absolutely they are in their own. And it's such a shame too, because they're both so good. And then I find my, there's other guys who I like later, like Tyler Davis flashes a bit for me. And I like Dwayne yes. Carter a bit and some, and then I'm like, and Chris Jenkins sometimes does some good stuff, but there's yep. nobody who I'm like, Oh, I, I like some of the things that Braden fist does. And then I also watch Braden fist get blown off the ball. And then I'm like, oh, okay. Like there's, there's really a huge gap between those two and literally like yep. everyone else. Yep. I, I will say TP made a comment there. Uh, Savion Williams, TCU fun late round pick. Yes, absolutely killed it at the shrine bowl. Um, and there's a clip I'm trying, I thought I posted it. I, so I searched, I can't find it, but there's a clip of him literally hurtling a dude. It is insanity. Cause he's six, four, like two ten, wow. and he catches a ball and he's just, I'm trying to remember who they played. It's TCU against, is it like Baylor maybe? And he's flying down the field and he just hurdles somebody. And I'm like, whoa, who is this guy? I was watching Jared Wiley for the senior bowl. Okay. And I, 
Savion Williams just kept popping. I'm like, who is this guy? And then I'm watching Imani Bailey and I keep seeing Savion Williams. So, uh, but yeah, no, I, I think, I think those guys are, are definitely in a tier on their own with uh, Newton and Will, uh, Murphy. And uh, yeah, I'm with you. There's a drop off. And I like Braden Fisk a lot. But the short short arms thing worries me a little bit. Sub three hundred pounds worries me a little bit. I, Solomon Thomas has me scarred for life. Um, oh, he was two eighty six, and I just I just struggle with guys like that. But I I do think Braden Fisk is fast enough to play as like a four i five. Mm. But I just I don't know if he's long. I don't know if he's long enough. I think I like him as a rotational, like three tech for yeah. anybody, even for the bills. Like you're going to run a four, three over front. Cool. Yeah. He's your, he's your third dude. He's your second three tech. He looks like Eric, you know, was, we were calling him baby Kyle Williams. Uh, yeah, that's know, a perfect way to see him. The bowl. And then, but again, I think that's also his upside. Like I think again, and Kyle Williams became like an all pro defensive tackle. Like, but he right. was, he very much like bucked the trend in yeah. a lot of ways. And I think fi- it's just hard to ask somebody to do that or expect somebody to do that. Plus I also, I don't know his age, but he's a bit older. Cause he was a, a sixth year senior. I believe this year at Florida state. Cause he was a transfer. Um, yeah. He played at Western Michigan, Yes, Western Michigan. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. That's where I was saying. I knew it was a team with a horse logo and I was like, what team is it? Yeah. That's what, yeah. I was confused. All the Westerns, Western Michigan, central Michigan, Eastern Michigan. There's too many. And then Michigan state that Mich- there's so many. Um, yeah, but again, him, like I like Fisk, but I like him and it's like, oh, cool. Like, what is he going to be? It's like rotational three tech. Right. Like, and I, and I was really hoping I watched Chris Jenkins. I was really hoping I would like more one tech aspects to his game. I think that's even part of it too, right? Like it's hard to find a good one tech. I feel like in this class, it's like limited. If you're looking at that, all these guys are like three techs. And they're usually siloed. Like this guy's a three tech and is a really good pass rusher. This mm-hmm. one is a really good run defender and can't pass rush worth a lick. I um, Marcus Harris from Auburn is another, like I liked him at the senior bowl a bit. I didn't love him on tape as much as I wanted to, but he gives you some peace. But again, he's more of um, a, a three tech piece. Silas come in saying Christian Boyd. Yeah. From university of Northern Iowa. Like, it's just there's so I haven't seen guys I feel like in so long in a, in a defensive tackle class that were so siloed. Like usually yeah. it's like, well, you know, you can do a little of this or well, the upside for this. It just feels like a lot of these guys are just silo and role specific on the interior. And it scares me. Like if I'm the Bills, I am prioritizing with how this draft is, I'm prioritizing defensive tackle in free agency. Like you better bring back Daquan Jones or go out and get yourself Sheldon Rankins or bring in, you know, Ashawn Robinson or Malcolm Roach or whoever, because you're probably getting a rotational guy in the draft because Byron yeah. Murphy is not going to fall to you. And even if Newton is there, you have positional redundancy with Ed Oliver. And part of me just wants to throw caution to the wind and say, screw it, just draft good football players and take Johnny Newton and worry about the schematic fit later. But yeah. you're not using him to his full potential if you're trying to play him at a one tech, so it doesn't really make sense. Like, I feel like at best the bills are coming out of this draft with a rotational defensive tackle based on how the class is based on how the board's looking like it's, Mm -hmm. it's not rough and, but it's just, it's so siloed in terms of usage and frame. Yeah. Well, McKinley, McKinley Jackson is a guy from Mississippi state. I wanted to like him more though. I didn't same, same dude. Both at the senior bowl and on tape. Like I just, I, because I feel like the one text in the upper tiers, it's like, Oh, sweat. And then yep. McKinley. And I'm like, I wanted to like his tape so bad. And yep. I just, but he, it. he's so on and off. Like there's a play, yeah. like there's plays where he's hitting an explosive first step with a great swim move. He's not getting reached. And then there's times where he's getting completely washed out of the play. He's turning his shoulders. Um, but there, I mean, there's, there's stuff to like at six, one, 330 pounds. Mm-hmm. The arm length is there. I, I think he can play as a one, a zero shade, even a little yeah. two Y. Um, I think the pass rush motor is good enough. I, I think, you know, again, the explosive first step is there, but he was banged up in 2022. He had a mm-hmm. drug charge in 2021. Oh, not great. I, I think there's some concerns. So I just don't know what to do with him. And I, I'm, I'm with you. I, you know, Tyler Davis is another one. Great first step when he wants to turn it on, but yeah. you just, they're so much that falls off there. And I think you get into a lot more with just guys and 
that's pretty much it. And even and even within like Davis and um, I'm just gonna say Rook because I have I can't pronounce his last yeah, name. I'm with you. Um, from Clemson, they do so many games up front. They're always running like twists and stunts. Every like, there's so little reps of just like come off the ball and let me see if you can show some pass rush moves against a guard or a tackle or center. Like everything is like two and three man games. It is. Yeah. We're going to stunt both tackles and we're going to loop around the edge or we're going to, we're putting Trotter and Barrett in the a gaps. We're going to do this game and do this blitz and do this stunt. It's so hard to just get like a true read. A lot of why I like Tyler Davis was just the motor and the hustle and the energy from the senior bowl. Like he was running down running backs, 15 yards downfield, like constantly getting after it. There was pop yeah. and juice off the snap. So I was, I was like, cool. Let me go into the tape and every game. It's just all these stunts and games, which is fun, but you don't really get to see him do much. Cause like he's lined up as a one tech or like as a two eye. And then he's looping around and occupy the right tackle or something, but he's just there to like, dance like and, and be yeah. a distraction so he's not doing anything so you're not getting any value out of the evaluation yep no and i and i think you get into some guys that they they just kind of play gap and they you know are, are playing gap control and they're they're focused on trying to stop the run and then there's no real pass rush value there's just there's so much up and down with this group um but like the way i have it after the top two guys it's it's tefandre sweat um, I mean, there's just so much to like with his game at, at that size, 360, 362 to move that way. I mean, it's just different. Um, do you think gonna, he stays? He, do you think he drops a little? Do you think he bumped? Tried they sound like some team tries to bump him down to like 350s or high or 100%. like that? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, and I think they can. I mean, I really think they can do that. Um, because he moves so well, and you're not, I don't think you're going to lose any of like the power or strength of his game but he's going to draw so much attention. I would love to see him in a place like Detroit because it would free up a Lee McNeil, Aiden Hutchinson. Um, mm. But again, I like, even if he went to Buffalo, like he would free up Ed Oliver so much as a three tech. Um, and obviously like Greg Russo, like there would be so much that you could do with him um, and, and just that whole front. And I think he provides versatility for you because he he could bump out to play a three if you wanted him to, and he would essentially just clog up that B gap, <laughs> and you'd you'd probably have to have a tackle come down and collapse, and that would free up a potential blitz up the middle, uh, right. with, with with you know some type of linebacker, um, maybe that you know again I don't know if linebacker is going to be a position of need in, in the first round or even a position of need that they look at. Um, I I will say and I, I probably should save this for the end of the show, but Edron Cooper from Texas A&M, I think would be Bro. a absolute blast in the bills defense. He would, he be, would be a, so, he's so fun to watch like the speed at which he moves and yeah. processes and triggers. And like, you can blitz him off, off the, the rail, baby. <laughs> going off the rail, I expected it. Um, but yeah, like he, you know, it's funny too. Somebody mocked him to the bills in the second round and, uh, everybody like hated him yeah, either. No. And no, he, I, I think he's linebacker one. Um, and mm -hmm. I say this as a person, like I like some of the things that Trotter does, but I just think Cooper is linebacker one with the versatility and just what he does. Like he plays fast. He's, he's angry. Like when he has the opportunity to finish someone, he finishes. He messed Jalen Milrow up a couple times. Bro, he killed Milrow. And then even in, um, Oh, who, in that Bama game, they run. I think it's just power. Cause I think it's a pulling guard and he diagnoses the pulling guard and slips underneath him and then just like Picks up Jace yes. McClellan and dumps yep. him like right in the A gap. Yep. The way he and dips his shoulders yes. and he just he's so fluid and so he's so twitched up and mm -hmm. explosive, like yeah. with his movements and he's got good eyes and he reads. Yeah, I think he's fun for like, or I would love to see him like go to Baltimore as like a replacement for Patrick Queen, even though like I like Trenton Simpson, like. Just, I want him to go to some team that's going to be like, we're going to move you all over and just let you run real fast and hit everything that moves. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's so many like fun options. I wish there was, I wish I felt, I'm granted he's at the top of the, 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 the linebacker class, but yeah, I just wish I felt more excited about the defensive tackle grouping, like after yeah. the top two, like sweat. I do like, you know, he had a good senior bowl week and there's some pass rush reps where he busts out a quick arm over a swim move and he wins instantaneously. Like he, mm -hmm. he plays how I hoped Siaki Ika was going to play last year for Baylor. Yeah. 
Ego was somebody who was like a dancing bear with how fluid he was. And I loved that. Mm -hmm. But then you'd watch him try to take on a double team or anchor. And he just did not have the heaviness in his lower body. And he's getting knocked around. Sweat is what I wanted Ika to be like a true plug in the interior, but he does offer a little bit of juice. It's just going to be interesting to see like, yeah, what do teams see him as? Can you knock down his weight enough? Do you think he can live on three downs? How much is he like right. just an early one and two down type of player? What does that value do? And again, I think he's even a good representation of that defensive tackle class because it's it's so it's just so siloed. You have to have so many conversations. There were so many guys who I wanted to like. Like I wanted to like Brandon Dorless from Oregon. I like some of the things that Michael Hall does um, yeah. from Ohio State. But I mean, he's gonna he's like two hundred eighty pounds. Like there's only so much you can do with him. Again, siloed. And he's only like six two. Yeah, like, he said like, that was yeah. I think he's six two two eighty. Like that's that's tiny. Like that's. That's Ed Oliver kind of tiny. And like, right. Ed and Oliver, you're not Ed Oliver. He's not you know, Ed Oliver. And Ed Oliver is an outlier. Like, and I even say this is somebody who I banged the table for Kalijah Cansey last year. Like, it's just, you have to be a stud with your hands and block recognition and block deconstruction and leverage and power and pop. So many things have to go right in your game to win at that size. Again, so he's probably like a rotational player. But it just get, it gets so muddy and scary with the defensive tackle class when you go down. Um, like I wanted to like Jordan Jefferson more than I did. I haven't watched Stackhouse from Georgia, even though I watched a bunch of Georgia defense tape. It's been all defensive back related. I shouldn't say defensive back. It's been all safety related with Bullard and Tyke Smith. But man, they, it gets they should scary. just go. They should just go out and sign uh, Justin Jones, the the defensive tackle from Chicago. I didn't like his tape. Oh well. I he, I did when he was coming out. I haven't watched his Bears tape. So if you've only, watched his Bears tape. I watched, and granted, I only, sample size is small. I only watched one game. I watched uh, the game against Washington. Um, I watched him for like some yeah. free agent stuff we were prepping last week. And I remember I remembered the name and the tape coming out. I saw the production and I was like, oh, okay. And I just didn't like him. I mean, again, I wouldn't mind taking a flyer on him, but he wasn't somebody who I liked um, yeah. as much. But again, that's what I mean. I'm Pickens. I, I, that's what I'm saying though. You bring in a guy like that on a cheap one or two year deal. You draft one of these defensive tackles we're talking about, obviously with Ed Oliver into the mix, I think you're kind of cooking with something there. Um, cooking with gas, baby cooking with gas. Yeah, Cause I don't know. Again, we we've taught, we hit so many names here. I, I don't know which one they get. If, if this is going to be a serious need for them, which one are they going to get? That's going to really contribute and take some pressure off of the interior parts of the defensive line. I, I, I don't know. You're not going to get it consistently. You're, you're going to have to get it on a rotational basis. Um, yeah. And then, like, yeah. even again, somebody who like, I, I like what Dwayne Carter did at the senior bowl. Like I haven't liked his tape as much as I liked him at the senior bowl. Um, yep. But okay. too. like, I'm happy with him coming, but again, what is, what's he doing? Like someone's gonna be like, Oh, why are you excited for this guy? I'm like, what? Cause he's a rotational three tech. Yeah. Like, right. That's what, like, that's what you're living in. If you're not getting Murphy, Again, Newton has positional redundancy, but if you're not getting Murphy and you're not getting Newton, you're probably not getting a starting defensive tackle. You know what? I'll throw Sweat into that mix too because I think Sweat can be like a starting one yeah. tech for somebody. Yeah. So if you're not and, getting – but there's a far gap between the top two and Sweat. No disrespect to yeah. Sweat. It's just that Newton um, and and Taylor – or Murphy are so good. And I do want to bring up this one, Charles. I know you've been banging the drum for him. Leonard Taylor, um, I'm a big Miami guy. I just watched him get blown off the ball so, so much, especially much, against dude. double teams. He's got a very yeah. narrow base. Mm -hmm. He gets hit. A, a guard will engage him and a center will feed him, block him and just knock him like four gaps outside. And just, he goes flying. He doesn't yeah. have the sand in his lower half to withstand things inside. And even juice going forward, like, for what he was two years ago, I thought he should have dominated more on their, their interior this year. And instead, it was Ruben Bain being nasty every single week for Miami. And I had to keep being like, is Taylor playing this week? Is Taylor playing? Like, again, it's yeah. fine to take a flyer. Maybe you tap into something, but he's not somebody who I enjoyed watching this I'm year. And then even in watching like a ton of Cam Kitchens and James Williams tape, I'm like, oh, who's on the ground? Oh, it's Leonard Taylor. Yeah, or he just completely disappears. Like, he just gets very complacent and it's just fine with being out there. And to me, like, 
you're playing in the trenches. You got to pop every now and again. Like you don't always have to get the football for me or get there, but at least pop. Just gum up the works. Just do something that makes life yeah. hard for an opponent. Like that's yep. that's fine for me. Yep. Like just make it difficult for yeah. it. That's, it. that's all I want. And he doesn't do it. I, I did see a comment about Christian Boyd out of Northern Iowa. I know he blew up the Shrine Bowl, and I heard a lot of positive things about him before that. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, it's Silas. Silas is the man. Um, but I don't. Uh, I don't. I haven't watched his tape, so I can't sit here and say anything positive. He could easily Same. become a a third or fourth ranked defensive tackle in this class uh, if if the tape matches. I mean, again, it all which depends no disrespect on- to him says a lot about the class. Correct. Correct. And I think that's the thing. And I, and again, you, you know, could he have a Kalen Saunders type rise in the draft? Mm. Who knows? You know, you don't, you don't know what you're going to get until obviously later this week and, and more tape continues to come out. So I thought, I, I thought this class was going to be better. Um, and then you get into the measurables and you're just like, dude, I don't know. I don't know what to do with these guys. I just don't know what to do with some of them because of the size, lack of length, weight issues, uh, lack of positional versatility, um, usage, usage at the college level. Like one thing I've learned over time is just how asinine some coaches are in college with what three, three, they five. do. A three, dude, the stack. It's stupid. It is the Dude. dumbest thing in the world. I hate Somebody that. who we're going to get into, I'm sure, for our edge conversation. Yeah. Into that mix, you know, Canton Zone. There's there's so much usage stuff where, yeah, like I would see somebody or how they were playing at the Senior Bowl or I'm looking at, you know, guys and I'm seeing size and frame and I'm like, all right, sweet. You know, and they're listed as a defensive tackle and I'm like, sweet. Let's see what we got. And then it's like, mm-hmm. oh, they're they're playing as a four eye in the stack all the time, or they're playing yeah. only as like a, a, a shade in the stack all the time. And they're not built for it. All it's mm-hmm. the, um, the Will McDonald conversation from last year from Iowa state, like this skinny look like a wide receiver playing defensive end with these pass rush ability yeah. and all this juice. He's in a four eye all the time yep. playing in the stack. Like it's and Iowa state's done that for forever, but yeah, it's, Actually, you know, and it's just but then you 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 lose a year of development by doing yes. that because the guy's got to come in and play a five, a six. He's got to play a new position, learn it in it, the NFL on the fly, on the fly, and you lose that year, and then all of a sudden now there's this pressure from the team, from the media, for him to take a step, another step forward, and like. You're just you're not setting these guys up for success. It's the same thing with like quarterbacks and the the helmet communication. Why are we not there yet? Like, what are we doing? Do you know that's what they're going to deal with in the NFL? It's 2024, 19, not 1961. It's that everybody at college has the giant boards with all these different. Yeah, we got giant, giant boards, and you got you the know, quarterbacks wearing like multicolored jerseys because they're doing, doing this, this and, and like, everything, and it's so hard. Just, just, just put a freaking earpiece in their helmet and say like, yeah, play four on your wristband. Exactly. And be done with it. Do a 10 second thing and be done with it. Spider Y2 banana. (laughs) Right, dude. It's just, it's nonsense what's going on. So yeah, no, I I don't know. Defensive tackle class. It's, it's underwhelming, very underwhelming. Um, It's like, I, I want to, I don't want to say it's like the tight end position because the tight end position is just outside of the top two. It is just trash. I like Sinat from Kansas state, not as like a top tier stud, but I liked them last year when I was watching BB. Um, yeah. And I like them this year, but again, I'm not looking at him to be like, man, this dude's a first round tight end. Yeah. And again, watch now there'll be like six guys that are coming out and they're all pros and all this stuff yep. at the position. But yeah, it just, it's not a deep class at tight end and defensive tackle. I think you, there's, there's some value and some, some deep players, but again, it's just underwhelming every time you put on the tape. I agree. But position grouping that has a little more excitement and more juice to it. The edge grouping. Mm-hmm. I'm sure, well, no, I want to foreshadow too much, but Russ, who is someone that you think the, and I feel like this is like, we're probably gonna have the same answer initially from like a top tier perspective, but like, who is someone that plays edge that you think could really help their draft stock come combine time? And if it's the person I think, I think this person is a sneaky pick at 28 for the Buffalo Bills. So who is that person potentially for you? That would be Darius Robinson out of Missouri. Um, yep. He did from my, from my neck of the woods, went to the same high school campus that I went to. Um, he went to Canton high school, which 
it's like a, I don't know, like a 20 acre campus or whatever it is. And there's three schools, there's Plymouth, there's Salem and there's Canton. And, uh, he went to Canton and it's the weirdest dynamic, but it's, it sets you up for the future, I guess. I don't know. Um, (laughs) but no, he, uh, super long, great, like just overall build yoked up out of his mind played in, we mentioned the three, three, five stack. He played in that, um, just so he's always out of position, but he, (laughs) he has a great long arm. He, he can definitely, you know, uh, transition speed to power. Uh, he's probably more power than speed, yes. but he's Absolutely. one of those guys that he's got a nice arm over move. He can swim um, with that. And then, it, you know, obviously just some of the, the club stuff that he has or swipe move that he has. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I like the skill set with him. My biggest issue is just the overall speed. Is it going to be fast enough to get to the quarterback consistently? Change of direction um, for me too. speed and change of direction. Yeah, I, I, I just worry about that stuff. But again, I, I think he's a... I think he's a good player and I think he's worthy of the conversation in the first round on the back end there. Um, testing will be huge for him this week. And if yep. he tests well, I, I think we'll, we'll see him as probably a solidified first round pick. He came into the senior bowl and measured six foot five, 286 pounds, 34 and six, eight inch arms. So basically has 35 inch arms at six, five, 286. And the way he plays off the edge again with playing in that stack he's mainly in like a four or a four eye and then you get some reps at five but he is he is pure like if you wanted to look up pocket compression in the dictionary it would be darius robinson just yeah. with how yoked up he is like he's got long arms again with almost 35 inch arms but they're thick like he is literally just put him in a wider alignment let him come downhill on an angle and just tell him, bro, just extend your arms and drive dudes into the backfield. Like when he gets both hands on you, like those hands, he's got good hand placement, but there's pop in those hands. And then he extends them to shed versus the run and even get into the backfield. Like, again, I don't think I, I want to see his change of direction numbers and his speed yeah. numbers. And th- this is somebody who I think if he tests well, it bumps him big time into the first round mm-hmm. consideration for a bunch of teams, but especially and specifically the Buffalo bills, because he fits their archetype into, yeah. they love bigger frame dudes. Like they want Von Miller is an outlier for edge. Leonard Floyd for them is an outlier at edge. They want pocket compression dudes. They want the Greg Russo's. They want big body, big frame type of dudes. You don't have to have a bunch of moves or bend or athleticism or juice. They're not looking for turn, you know, run the arc and dip underneath and yeah. ghost move and all ghost rush and all that kind of stuff. They want you to run through somebody's chest, defend the run and compress the pocket at all costs. And that is literally Darius Robinson in a bottle. And if he has yeah. a horrible combine, I think he's, he stays in the second round. I, I don't think he slips all the way to 60, but maybe he potentially does. But with his frame and how impressive he looks, also, considering he goes kind of playing "quote unquote" out of position at Missouri, if he tests well, I think he becomes a strong, strong, strong candidate for the Bills at twenty-eight, given their need on the defensive line and given how much of an archetype fit he is for that that spot for the Bills. But again, even not just for the Bills, he's going to be on a lot of dudes' radar. Like as far as teams, like anybody who needs an edge presence, like or even two. I don't know. Maybe there are some three, four teams out there that think, you know, we're going to put him at three, four end because we see how physical he is and how thick he is. And with his long arms, maybe we think we can get him up to like 290 or above that. We're going to add on to him. We're not going to play to speed. We're going to play to the strength and the physicality and the thickness and add on that way. I think he's got a lot of things that teams will like. And if he tests well, given how he looks and how he's built, it could be really interesting with Darius Robinson. 100%. Hundred percent. I, I and I, I again. I think he could go even earlier than than twenty eight. I, I think Arizona is very intriguing. I, I think Green Bay is intriguing. Um, he had a good I, Senior I think, Bowl too. And if he adds on top of that with like a good combine with how he's going to show up, like yeah, man, like I could see him being that name that's like goes yeah goes in the top twenty and everybody's like really and it's like yeah well the combine he had is nuts or it's that it's that dark horse name that everybody's throwing out like a week before the draft because he crushed the combine. Yeah. Nope. And if, again, if he's off the board, I I think, you know, I I don't know. I don't think the, the bills will get fortunate enough that Jared verse or Latu will fall to them. Um, it's possible. I, I, I doubt it. I don't think Dallas Turner, I, I I think Dallas Turner's the the best defensive player in the draft. So, uh, 
Yeah, no, I, I do. Um, it's close. I also, want, I also want him to go to somebody who like, he's so athletic. Like you can drop him into space and do a couple like mm-hmm. fun things. And granted the bills could do that with like a simulated pressure or a creeper, but like, I want him to go to more of like a, a three, four base team where you can rush him off the edge, but you can do some fun things with him. Cause he's got a really fun, like he's, I don't think he's the complete, I don't think he's as dominant of a pass rusher as Will Anderson, but he's more mm-hmm. athletic than Will Anderson. And you can do a lot of fun things with Dallas Turner. A hundred percent. And I, and I think the thing with him is like, I think of like Minnesota, depending on what they do with quarterback, if mm. Kirk cousins is their guy and they continue to move forward with him, they move on from Daniel Hunter or, or whatever they're going to do there. You know, do they bring uh do they bring in a player like Dallas Turner for Brian Flores? I think it would be great. Man, that'd be sick. Um, yeah. I think that'd be a great spot for him. So obviously we'll kind of see what, what ends up happening there, but like, Again, you get away from those three guys, you get away from Darius, you know, does Chop Robinson fall into the mix? I'm not a big Chop Robinson guy. I was going to say, there were a couple of questions that came in saying Darius or Chop, um, and then, you know, this comment here saying, I don't like Chop Robinson one bit. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he, I'll, I'll let you speak on him first. I just, I felt he's got a really great get off, like not to yeah. steal your thunder. Like that get off is awesome. I posted a clip today where he, he, the ball is snapped and he's basically past the right tackle before the ball is at the quarterback's hands. But was it you, against Michigan state? No, it was against oh. Rutgers. Okay. Um, but he's got a, he's got a rep like that against Michigan. He's got a rep like that against Michigan state. He's got a rep like that against Rutgers. Like that's yeah. his like go-to thing. But I just find myself wanting from like a moves perspective or like a motor perspective. Like I know, and some people like him. Some people think like, oh man, you can put him in an odd front or put him in a wide nine, even front and some like cool stuff that you can do. And like have him just come screaming off the edge in a wide nine. I just, I don't know. Like I just, I just felt myself like watching him being like, eh, but not really being happy. Yeah, no, I mean, well, Cleveland doesn't have a first round pick, so he's not going there because that's where the wide nine is with Jim Schwartz. So, yeah, I mean, look, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of him. Um, you know, kind of a spoiler for everybody. He's 43rd on my board. Um, I'm Which just, I'm not, I wouldn't hate it. I don't love him as a player. I wouldn't hate it if the Bills took him at 60, depending on how things went, but I wouldn't, I still don't love it. I also don't think, from a Bills perspective, I don't think he's an archetype fit. No. Um, I just, I just don't know how in, we talked about, I don't know how he wins consistently in the NFL. Like, are you well, just going to rely on get off? Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, like I, the first sentence I have on his strengths is violent disruptor that gets up field in a hurry due to his explosive first step mm-hmm. effective rip move. His rip move is great, mm-hmm. but like, that's the most traditional basic pass rush move that there is. I've seen you know, a swipe. I've seen a swipe a couple times as he turns the arc and bends a little bit. Yeah. Like, but he, he doesn't turn his shoulders against the run too often. Um, mm-hmm. or he turned, excuse me, he turns his shoulders against the run too often struggles to get home on his pass rush. He has limited counter moves in his pass rush. He rarely fights pressure with pressure. Um, and like, for me, like he's such an intriguing player because there's so much potential. He has the tools and the athletic ability Absolutely. And that like that translates to being an effective three down player in the NFL, but much of his success is going to be determined on if he can get home against the pass and, and, and do that more consistently. And then if he can get stronger against the run yep. and he's going to probably check in at like a sub two fifty in a couple of days, which is also like not a concern, but like, that's not really kind of is, kinda is. Yeah, like yeah, there, there's only so much he can add to his frame. Like he's, he kind of looks maxed out already. And right. I just like, I see stuff where people are like, yeah, he's like a five, like top five, top 10 player in the draft. I'm like, there's no way. Like you are the same people that said Trayvon Walker was the best player in the draft. And you only said that because you knew he was going as the number one overall pick. Like, and he was not the best player in that draft. Like there was no way in hell he was better than Kayvon Thibodeau, Sauce Gardner, Aiden Hutchinson. There's no effing way. And the sure. same thing with Chop Robinson. He's not better than Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison, Caleb Williams, mm-hmm. Joe Alt, Brock Bowers. He's not better than Talise Fuaga, Olu Fashanu. He's not better than Roma Dunze. Like, he's not better than those guys. Like, I went down the list, and I, like every time I went down it, I was like, he's not better than this guy, this guy. And then I did the grain, and I was like, this is where he's going. It is what it is. If I get roasted, cool. Um <laughs> I have a couple of edge rushers I would take over him. And again, if, if he's there at 28 and the, the bills end up taking him, so be it. 
I just, I struggle with him. I really do. And I get that gut feeling with one player or two players every year. And Chop Robinson is one of those guys where the gut is telling me, Bro, don't. I'm in the same, and I don't know if it's because I'm forever scarred from Aaron Maben. Maben? <laughs> I knew you were yep. going to go there. I just don't. I see Chop and, and I fought, you know, no, because I fought hard against it with Owe and I liked Owe. Mm-hmm. Um, really the, all three and all three guys have developed differently. The, the back end of that draft with Rousseau, Owe, and then try on Sharinka, like how each, each has been used differently and how they've developed differently. Like they've all become like startable edges. Um, yeah. but I liked Owe even without the production and, but everything was telling me like, Oh, a skinny edge from Penn state, like Aaron Maben, Aaron Maben. But I kept watching the tape and I bought into Owe. Yeah. And I just haven't with chop and there's something that just keeps screaming at me to not Dude. take him. And, and th- th- I even, and I don't love some of the dudes. Like I would rather have Chris Braswell than chop. And like, even, even though I don't love Braylon Trice, I'd rather take Braylon Trice to just be like, yo, compress that tackle every single rep and yeah. just be a bull in a China shop on every single rep. I might even, I haven't finished my email. I know how much you love him. I might even go Gabriel Murphy. I over would chop. Like, I, yeah, you love him. Like I, I just, there's something that just does not make me feel comfortable watching his game. Like, and I, and I want to buy in because mm-hmm. of the you know, playing at Penn state and the, that defense was so good and he does flash at times. And the name is also awesome. And yeah, yeah I, I don't know why. Like I, I remember coming into the season and kept hearing about, and not even hearing from other people, but like my own individual excitement for Kalen King and Chop Robinson at Penn State. And then as the season went on, each week I was just like, oh. Dude, oh, Kalen like King is the worst before. tackling corner I've ever seen in my life. And he got roasted at the Senior Bowl, like left and right. Like, man, between Kalen King and then uh, Caleb Bullock, the safety from USC, like, I don't yeah. know who's a work tackler. And yeah, it's just. I just felt like they, those Penn State dudes that I wanted to be dudes this year, like, were underwhelming. Like, I feel like I got as excited watching Adisa Isaac as I did watching Chop Robinson. And I hundred percent, hundred percent. There's more traits for Chop. I'm just, it. Dude, I'm just weird. Had, I feel like he had four weird. sacks this year, and two of them came against UMass. You, hey, well, UMass, man. National power, Nick like, Saban's UMass. Come on, dude. And I know against Michigan, they ran it 50 times in a row, and you couldn't do anything in the second half. But come on, man. Like, production matters to an extent. And I just, I don't, dude, I, I don't know. I struggle yeah, with that. And, and even coming out of last year, like, PFF, who rewards half sacks as whole sacks, his highest was five sacks last year. He had two at Maryland in 2021. He had five last year uh, for Penn State, and he had three this year. Last year, he had 48 pressures, five sacks. This year, he had 26. Again, he was banged up a bit. 26 pressures, three sacks. And then you're not seeing a ton of stops either. 12 stops against the run this year, 17 last year. Like, I just don't know. Is he a pass rush specialist? Is he like, are you bringing him in and you're, you're working him on third downs? But then again, even if he's a pass rush specialist, I don't see him winning in the ways that are going to be like, he's an impact. Like if he's a pass, not specialist, the first round. no, no. And what's his timeline. Is he making an impact at the end of the season? Is it a 2025 type of pick? Are you yeah. just playing him for juice and rotation this year? Like he's a dude that scares me like a little bit. And even with like the, the edge grouping, like I wanted to like Jonah Ellis from Utah. I didn't a bunch. I'm still a little concerned with uh Braswell from like a pass rush standpoint in terms of moves and i didn't love what he did at the senior bowl well, yeah. he wasn't terrible he, he responded he had a bad tuesday a better wednesday but i just go back to the tape and i just think you can do a lot worse than an edge defender that you know is going to set the run like i'm watching him compress the pocket against tackles and i'm watching him bust out a cross chop every now and again and then the real like i'm watching him come off the line see a tackle down block and turn and realize, uh Oh, a guard is pulling and I'm watching mm-hmm. him lower into his outside leg and just launch into a guard and jack him up and squeeze the hole. Like, right. I, 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 
and, I, and that at least gives me, okay, you know what? Chop Robinson probably has a higher floor or higher ceiling than Chris Braswell, but Braswell gives you a much, much higher floor. And I don't think his pass rush stuff is great, but there's stuff you can work with. And at the very least, he can compress the pocket a bit and he's going to play the run like a maniac because you know yeah. how he plays the game. And he at least counters. He at least yes. has those 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 arm over There's counter some kind of understanding to read and react to me like, oh, this isn't working. Let me try this in the moment and within out the course of the game. Right. Exactly. And like there's times where he kind of just runs into a sack and mm-hmm. and and things like that. But like Brad, which happens for Dallas Turner too. Like Bama's causing chaos up front. Like ego yeah. would be or, or make something happen or somebody's blitzing and you fall into one. Like right. right. Yeah. Which is why I would love him and well, I would hate it, but I would love to see him in Minnesota with Brian Flores because he's gonna dice some things oh up God, and it's yeah. gonna work for and for you Dallas. imagine too, like with that kind of chaotic scheme, like is Turner blitzing is he dropping is he gonna peel out and take the running back like man there's so right. many fun things you can do with a guy with that there's athletic so profile. many things guy but a guy like chop like yeah he's he's dropped into space but i don't trust it like it's not an effective drop into space it's it, yeah. you're you're doing it because you're trying to throw off the offense but it's not like he's he's functioning out there he's just out there exactly like he's one of two players for me he's either going to be barcavius mingo or he's going to be God. vic beasley one of the two I don't, love either of them. I don't love either of them, but he's going to have to become one of them too, because like, oh I don't know, like he's, if he's going to get drafted high, there's going to be an expectation and I don't know which one he's going to be like, I, I just, I don't know, but some other players, you mentioned Gabriel Murphy. Um, I don't want to keep dogging on chop. This isn't a, a, a disguised on chop. Um, That's funny. No, but I think it's a fair conversation because yeah. there are, I don't remember who, but a prominent draft analyst mocked, chop to the bills yesterday or over the weekend. And I just know with how the bills, the bills aren't going to be able to solve their, they have six, they have six rostered players on their defensive line right now. Six. That's it. Even if all six of those dudes were all pros, they'd still need to add, but all six of those dudes are not all pros. They're going to have to add to the defensive line on the interior and on the edge in this draft. And so until free agency kind of weans out some of those needs, I think it's important. Again, I don't want to bag on somebody like that over and over again, but I think it's a name that's consistently going to get fed into the news cycle for Bills yeah. fans at pick 28 because of the name, because of the helmet, and because of some of the traits. And I just, I, I think it's important to kind of set that expectation of like, cool, he might turn into something, or he might be Barkevius Mingo or Vic Beasley. Dude, it's <laughs> sorry. That's just my job. I don't know. Like, it's just. It is what it is, but I, I will talk about Gabriel Murphy out of UCLA. So much to like within his game. Um, Latu at times, like, and that's the thing, like, and I, I don't know why, like, maybe that's why I fell for guys like Braswell and Murphy because they were kind of in the shadows of these top tier edge rushers in this year's draft um, mm-hmm. with Braswell kind of in the shadows of, of Dallas Turner and Murphy in the shadows of kind of his brother, Grayson, and then yes. obviously of Latu. But with Gabriel, like, Length is going to be a problem. He doesn't look like he has very long arms, which is fine. Um, he just reminds me so much of Alex Highsmith. Great motor, chomping at the bit to get in the backfield. He does anything he can to stop the run. Um, there's times he gets washed. There's times that he's running the arc and just kind of gets shoved out of the way. Um, and that's going to happen. But the, the, the speed that he has and the violence within his hands and the hand usage it's tremendous. And the way he bends down the line of scrimmage and makes some of those stops and those tackles, like Latu didn't show that all the time. And Latu at times looks hesitant against the run. And I think a lot of it's because of the neck injuries that forced him to retire that he sustained up in Washington. Mm. So like Murphy just goes balls to the wall. And I love guys like that pedal to the metal. And I I'm just going to bet on this guy. Like if I, if I could pick from four to five years now, a player that I feel like could get me, let's say 30 sacks over a four or five year span. We're talking, I don't know, six or seven a year. I feel like Gabriel Murphy can be that guy where some of these guys that we've talked about earlier, one in particular, I don't know if he can do that for me. I think Gabriel Murphy can. And then he still is going to be an asset on second and short when I need it or first and 10. I just feel like you can play him a little bit more on third down. Le- again, length and overall size could be questioned, but I'm really curious how he's going to measure and how he's going to test. And I think personally, 
he's a top 50 player in this year's draft. And I see mock drafts where he's like ranked 220 or something. And I'm like, there's no way you can watch his tape and say that when you, maybe it's regency, regency bias or recency mm -hmm. bias, but I've watched, let's see. Uh, I'm say count it off. And I really want him to like real quick. Like I want him to hit for you because you're not very, you're not like a give analysis or like scout a guy just so you can be first. But yeah. you very much were like the plant the flag for Gabriel Murphy. Like, yeah. and I want him to hit so bad because yeah. no one was out there being like, oh yeah, Gabriel Murphy. Like you were out here like championing him. Yeah. I've, I've, I've watched 11 edge rushers and you know, keep in mind, you have about 11 positions. You scout, you throw 10 or 11 in each one. You get to about a hundred players. Um, I also know yeah. it's real when you text me, when you'd be like, Hey man, have you watched this guy? I'm like, Oh, Russ really likes somebody. Yeah. And I just, I like him more than Braylon Trice. I like Braylon Trice, but hand usage is a bit of a concern. I don't know what the speed is there. I don't know about change of direction. He looks kind of stiff in the hips from time to time. I Murphy, wanted, I wanted to like Trice more than I did. And I've watched him a bunch in season and on tape. And I kept waiting for me to be like, Oh, there it is. And I just kept being like, when I've watched like four games of a dude and I have to be like, well, maybe I haven't watched the right game yet. Then I'm like, eh, that's a problem. Yeah. But, and that's like, and I, I don't know. I just, I struggle with Trice a little bit. I wanted to like him more and I just didn't like, I don't know. One of those guys though, that kind of, when you think of like overall height, weight, size kind of fits the bills in a sense, like absolutely pocket compressor. Nasty He's like a bigger George Karloff, this type dude, like just leader, like the type of dude, like from a character aspect, like that you want. Yeah. Like you could do worse than Braylon Trice. I just don't like, I just, I wanted to like him more than I did. Like, whereas, whereas I went into watching Darius Robinson and I liked him more than I thought I would, even though he doesn't have a repertoire of moves. And I do have questions about his speed and change direction. There were some reps where Darius Robinson's like, extending against a tight end and throwing him out of the way and like swatting a running back out of his way and like flushing Jaden Daniels from the pocket against LSU. Like there are some clips, even Gabriel Murphy, like as soon as you told me when well, you also sent me clips, but then that day that you text me about Murphy, I watched whatever game you started pulling clips from UCLA is wearing their away jerseys. They're and playing Utah. Thank you. Okay, cool. And he's got, it's like the first, the first series. It's just like, on the snap and he completely just goes somebody as soon as he like goes through, like they're, they're defeated like immediately. And he's got mm -hmm. so many reps like against the run in the past where like he gets past his man or makes his man face plant in like a quarter of a second. And I was like, Oh, this is fun. And yeah, I, 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 I want given all the production from a pressure perspective from Trice and some of these other guys, like I expected to have more things to hang my hat on. Yeah. And I didn't. And so I think the edge grouping is like deeper than defensive tackle, but I do have some concerns even with that mm -hmm. like grouping as well. I feel like edge gets for there's plenty, not plenty, but there's a handful of edges that I would be cool with in the first round. Mm -hmm. After that, I almost like don't want to touch an edge until like round three or four, because I don't like what the crop is going to look like in the second round. Unless like, again, I'm not as, deep into the Murphy evaluation. I only watched one game of him so far, but like with how you speak about him and what I saw from that game, I wouldn't be, I would be okay with him at 60, but like the odds of that one guy being there. And then if he's not there, what are you looking at in that second round? Like I just right. get, is Braswell there? Like does do teams bite on Austin Booker from Kansas? Like do, I don't know, does Xavier Thomas from Clemson like pop up somebody who I'm interested to watch who, I remember from, I'm looking at like different things now. And I remember him from gaming against Colorado, uh, Muhammad Kamara from Colorado state, but Colorado's offensive line is terrible. He tore up that Colorado mm -hmm. game. I do remember that. So he's, if I remember correctly, he's smaller. I think he's like 250 or 260 pounds. And he's another dude that's tiny. Like I just, it gets scary once you're in like the second and third round crop. So it makes me almost want to wait till the back end of three or four to take an edge. If you're not getting one in round one. No, I'm with you. I, and I, I think, you know, there's that, there's that drop off. It's top heavy. Once you get past Turner, lot to inverse, you can throw in Darius Robinson. He's kind of in his separate tier. It just, it gets a little dicey with, you know, 
Chop and Trice and then Jonah Ellis and um, you know, Adisa Isaac. There's there's a lot to like with him, but he's only 250 pounds. He's got long arms, but his lower body doesn't always flow with his upper body. And then, you know, he's he had a torn Achilles two years ago, and I think that's kind of put some limitations within his game. Um, but I, I still like the player. Uh, I think there's good lateral movement there. I think he's got, you know, a good, a good rip move. Um, mm. and I, I think he's got, you know, good hand usage overall, but yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I just, I, I don't, I think, but I, I don't know though. At the same time, I'm like, I feel like the deeper I go, the more wild cards I continue to uncover. And I'm like, once I get through like the third and fourth round, I'm like, I don't know what else is really left out there. Austin Booker out of Kansas. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of potential there, but undersized hasn't played a lot of football. I don't but know what you do where the combine can come in. Cause what if somebody blows up the combine and has yeah. like the change of direction scores or the speed or like yeah. adventure, like what they weigh in at and how they show up. Like there's so many, I think, aesthetic pieces and testing measurables that I think could help somebody stand out, not just for the evaluation committee, but in terms of like helping solidify, okay, like this dude can be a solid person in round three or a solid person early on day two or this, again, not even just talking about Robinson, like Darius, that is like propelling him to the first round. But I think the combine can go a long way for this position group, even defensive tackle to a degree, but edge, because there are some traitsy guys and wild card flyers that I think have the opportunity to kind of set themselves apart by just having a really strong combine and giving you something to hang your hat on as an organization. Yeah. And I mean, a, a day three guy I like that I've, I've watched one ga game on is uh, Solomon Bird out of USC. I, oh, yeah. I like oh, him. Yeah. I mean, there's the, the, again, it's one game. So I don't necessarily know where I'm going to go from there, but I thought. You know, from a pass rush standpoint, he's a specialist. He's going to get after the quarterback, but I just stuff in the run. I thought he kind of struggled there. He's not going to fight pressure with pressure consistently. Um, you know, controlling the gap isn't going to be really his thing. He's going to get after the quarterback, and that might be it. And that's the thing. I think you're going to get guys that can get after the quarterback or help stop the run. But other than that, you're not finding a lot of guys that can go both ways. You're going to find guys that are just – you know, just, just doing the one thing. And it's like, well, what, what is that one thing that your team is going to value? And for the bills, I think probably getting after the quarterback, getting somebody else that can get after the quarterback is going to, going to be valuable. But again, that could they, I mean, they have so much draft capital. Could they go, you know, an edge rusher in the third round and an edge rusher in the fifth or sixth round? They Very could double possible. tip in a whole bunch of ways because of the capital, or they could, package some of those picks and move up. Yeah. And go quality over quantity. Like if they wanted to do that, like that another guy too, I wanted to mention just on day three, um, Jasheen Davis, the edge from wake forest. I think he just has some, I, I, I say this with how guys like play their play styles. He's got some Velociraptor to him with how he plays, like his hand usage, his motor, his get off. Like he's just violent, like point A to point B straight line after the QB, but he's another one. Wake Forest plays a three, three, five. So he's at like a four eye a whole bunch and they're doing all these mm -hmm. run stunts and all these things. And so like a lot of times he's, he's just like a spike inside here, try and take up the guard in the tackle or, or the guard in the center. And he's like 260 pounds. I think he's going to weigh in somewhere in that range is what he, he's listed on PFF. So like you have a 260 pound four eye that's playing here all the time. Like that gets a little like wonky for me, but he's got an aspect to his game. He's the one who, I started watching for him and then Malik Mustafa, the safety from Wake Forest, just started flashing left and right. But yeah. I initially was watching for Davis. Yeah, we'll talk about Mustafa in a minute. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Davis is somebody who I like on day three. But again, that's like, cool, what's he going to be? Like, he's your edge four. And I yeah. think he could develop and become like an edge two for someone. But you could do a lot. Like, I like him because he's got a high motor. He, he works on – he's 100 miles an hour on every single rep. And he may lose – but he bangs like whatever you ask him to do, he's doing, he will take on whoever he will line up wherever. And even if his technique isn't perfect or the read isn't perfect, he just works so hard that he like, he just muddies things and just like, mm -hmm. it's not always pretty, but he gums up the works because of how he plays. He, I don't want to put him in the same category. Cause I really like this other guy from Wake Forest last year, Kobe Turner. He reminds me of Kobe Turner a little bit. Turner had much cleaner wins. 
And yeah. I thought he was drastically overlooked in last year's class. And he had a phenomenal year for the Rams, but he's got some of that aspect like Kobe Turner did, where even when it's not pretty, it just messes things up for the offense because there's such a high motor and violence and velociraptor to his game. Right. Um, that's a favorite piece. All right. Last one. We're going mad late. But you know what? It's fine because it's draft time. It only happens once a year. This is our Christmas. Last piece. So safety. we got the trees up still. Damn right. I got the little Valentine's Day tree there. And then I didn't take this one down because – so my wife was like, it's February. You got to take the tree down. And I was like, but the garland's red, and it's Valentine's Day month. So I should I can leave it, right? And she was like, fine. But March, it's done. I'm taking it down. And I was like, all right. Yeah. But the little one will stay up, and then I'll make it St. <laughs> Patrick's Day themed. Safety. Position – of need for the Buffalo Bills as they stand right now. Mike, a high free agent. There is a literal hole at that safety spot starting opposite of Jordan Poyer. Who knows? Jordan Poyer could potentially be a cap casualty given what his savings would be if he is released. But regardless of that, Bills need a safety as of right now. They're probably going to need some safety depth as well. I expect them to attack it in free agency, but I would not rule out a safety coming out of the draft. Let's talk about who to watch for at the 2024 NFL Combine for safety. Who do you think could really help help themselves? Is it early? Is it somebody potentially hurting themselves? Is it a day two guy, a day three guy? What what when the, when it comes to safety, where's your head and mind and your eyes at for the combine? Yeah, I mean, I I really like Tyler Newbin out of Minnesota. Um, I think he's safety. got, I, I think he's got the potential to be the best safety in the class. I really do. Um, his dad played at Eastern Michigan, and and he's developed into a full time starter at Minnesota since twenty twenty one. Um, I I really like the way he buzzes down. I like the way he covers tight ends. Um, I think he can play down in the box when you need him to, but I, I think at the same time you, you want to have him. That's funny for rest of but the tree is green, but it technically it's not, it's frosted with white. So it's more white than green, but I like where your head is at Ralph. Um, <laughs> yeah. Newbin is also the Minnesota career, like interception leader with 13. Like he's always around the ball. Yeah, no great ball skills. I think he can do those split, um, split safety responsibilities, yeah. whether it be a two high single high. There's so much to like within his game. Testing will be huge for him. Yeah. Um, and I think the I, testing I, could go a long way with separating him and Cam Kitchens because I don't think Cam's going to test well, and either. I think Newbin will test better. And yeah. Newbin's it, tape is also – both of their tape – I love both their tapes, but it, granted they play in different ways, but with Newbin, he's going to be like 6'1", 6'2", probably 205 to 210 pounds, and he's going to run and test much better than Cam. Yeah, yep. No, exactly. And I, and I think with Tyler, it's one of those where he's going to hit all of the drills and I think he's going to do relatively well. Um, you know, I, I try not to do a lot of pro comparison on guys, but when you got a six foot two, 210 pound safety, it, there, there's just so much to be desired with overall size and, um, again, just the way he moves. So I think he's going to do wonders. I think he could get into the back end of the first round conversation, especially with a team like Buffalo, because I think it's a glaring need. And I think it's kind of become a, it's, it's been a need for a little bit of time and they've just kind of put scotch tape over it and a band aid over it. They and need just, more juice and athleticism at that position. Like for as versatile and as Hyde and Poyer have been the past couple of years, the mileage on the tires has started to show more and more. Yeah. And, and I could see them going after like a Tracy Walker. I could see them getting a, a former Detroit line and bring him in. Um, but at the same time, I could see Tracy Walker going to Philadelphia and joining uh, his cousin Darius Slay there. So we'll, we'll kind of see what happens there, but no, I, I'm a big fan of Tyler Newbin. Um, I'm very curious, and I know you're not a huge fan of him, but uh, Jaden Hicks, I'll be curious mm. how he tests. Um, I think he's a little bit more of that buzz defender playing down in the box. There's much to be desired there with 6'3", 212. Uh, I love the way he comes up and tries to hit, though. Yes. Um, I, I think, you know, whether if he was down in the box, you know, hook curl, uh, again, just as that buzz defender, playing kind of in that overhang from time to time, I, I think will be key. Maybe being that post safety from time to time, mm -hmm. but I just, I struggle with him because he looks a little stiff yes. and what's he going to test. And I don't know if there's a safety in this class that's going to wow us with their overall testing. I really don't. I think maybe, you know, maybe Javon Bowler, maybe mm -hmm. uh, we'll see. Um, I, I just don't know. You know, I don't know who it's going to be. I want it to like uh, Kalen Bullock more. Yeah. Can't tackle. You can't no. be on my board. I just, there's so much potential there 
right? Like he looks the part. He yes. looks cool as hell. Got and then I watch him come. He can put, I'll do all this stuff from the post. And then that, that oh. clip against Utah forever lives in my head of him. Dude. Just, and, and there's so many, like, he's just such a bad tackler. Yeah. And he's just, it's bad. But you know, for me, the top two guys are, are cam and, and Tyler Newbin. I, I think those are the, out of the guys I've watched, um, pulling up number of safeties. Sorry. They're the last group. Um, Disrespectful. yeah, six safeties I've gotten to, I think those are the two of the, the six that I've watched are, are the best ones. Um, you know, I like Tyke Smith a little bit out of Georgia, uh, yeah. but I think there's some limitations there. I, I don't know how much single high stuff you're going to do with him. Is he like you meant, I, I think we were talking about him. You said more of like that apex and mm -hmm. kind of overhang role. Is that what he's going to do? I just, I don't know. I think he's a versatile chess piece to your defense, but again, single high, there's some limitations. So coming downhill, there's a lot of good, but roaming over the top, I just don't know with Tyke Smith. I like this class for some depth, and I think you might be able to find some key role players, but how many safety sets are you rolling on your defense? Are you running two or three? Are you know what are you planning on doing with your with with your defensive backfield uh, where you can get two or three safeties on it at the same time? So I don't know. I echo a lot of your sentiments. Um, and yeah, I think Newbin's going to test really well. And when you put that testing <clears throat> with the tape, like just with the professional coverages he's playing, they're out there playing, you know, quarters and cover two, and mm -hmm. he's playing into the boundaries, playing in the field side. He's playing, he's playing the robber and like Tampa two robber, like Tampa two invert, depending on how you want to look, look at it. Like he's man covering versus tight ends. Like he, he just played such a professional type of safety at Minnesota and had such ball production. And then he's also like a violent hitter. Like he has that one rep against Nebraska from 2022, where he just absolutely bodies the receiver coming across the middle. Like I just, and then the size and the frame, the range, the eyes, he's able to bait quarterbacks. And it just, I think when you see the tape in his skill set. I think he'll have the type of combine that will propel him into the first round. Potentially. I think it'll propel him to be the first safety off the board, wherever that goes. It could be early two, middle two. It could be early one. I think he's going to have a combine that'll make him safety one. Yeah. Juxta and then putting that together with cam kitchens, who I also really love. I just don't think cam's going to test. Well, I could see him running like a four five, six forty, or some kind of 40 that are just, and change, I just don't think he's going to test well, change the direction stuff like 40 times bench. I don't know how great he's going to do like with any of like the baseline measurable type stuff, but the tape is just tremendous with how he plays also really good ball production. Like with what he's done in Miami forces, fumbles plays like a velociraptor at that safety spot. But then you also look at that Miami defense, like this very, playing on the forefoot like type of defense, very blitz heavy attack minded. They're, they're doing a lot of match coverages, which travels and translates well to the NFL, but it is very, you know, we're attacking, we're blitzing, we're running this. It, it It's a type of defense that doesn't exist holistically across the NFL, but I did think it had elements that prepares him. Well, even going to the bills now with a uh, Jamila die being there. But my big thing with him is, he gets risky two times or too much at times. Like he sees the QB's eyes and he thinks the ball is going over here and it's actually going somewhere else. But again, part of that risk that he's taken has yielded the production or has led to, I should say the production that he's had um, at Miami, just always being around the football and getting sacks and forcing fumbles and getting interceptions. And so it's kind of hard to fault him. In that mm -hmm. regard, I mean, he's got 11 career interceptions, five this year, six last year. I really like Cam's game, but again, I don't think he's going to test that well. And then some of the yeah. dudes on the back end, like day two safeties, day three safeties, this is where I'm really interested to see what the combine does. I really like Jalen Simpson out of Auburn, but he's tiny. It, this was his first year playing safety. He used to be yeah. a corner. He's five listed at 5'11", 178 pounds. I watch him close and I watch him run. I think he's going to test well in the 40. I think he's going to run mm -hmm. well. And he should. He, you're going to be like 180 pounds. You better run like real fast. But yeah. my concern with him is all the physical aspects. Like he's still learning how to fit the run. He's still got to like actually fit the run and bang in the alley and go up against NFL body yeah. types as blockers and as ball carriers. Like I think that's going to be a challenge. But 
he's, I sent you some of the clips when I went through like the four games I did for him. I mean, watching him close on Brock Bowers and punch through Brock Bowers and force an incompletion, watching him close down and jump an in route from Malik neighbors. Like he's going to get up against some studs in the sec and he's holding his own. And again, it's his first year as a safety. Yeah. I love the idea of seeing if you can add on to his frame, getting him to that 185, 186, pushing 190 potentially, but leaving him in the middle 180s, allowing him to continue to see the field and get better. And I think he'll test decently well from a like an, an agility and run standpoint. Malik Mustafa is also another one. Um, and so is Kaiton Oladapo from Oregon State. Um, yeah. I, I think Mustafa just plays like a heat seeking missile. And I want to see if the times like the time times match what you see on tape. I don't think he's going to run like a four, three or a four, four, but at five eleven, two hundred and seven 207 pounds, I think he could propel himself into a nice part of the day three, or maybe back end of day two conversation. The, the thing with him is just the coverages again, similar to Jasheen Davis. It's the coverages they're playing there. Like he's got right. good range as a post safety, but they're just really doing a lot of cover three stuff. They have him doing, um, playing some apex and some nickel. They've got him as a linebacker and a spy at times against mobile QBs. Like, so is he a nickel safety hybrid? Where does he fit? And then Oladapo just huge listed at six, two, 219 pounds, dude, he's massive hustles. He's got good speed. Um, I, I forget what team that I clipped that play where he runs down the running back and forces the football. I think it's against Oregon. Maybe I was gonna say, I think that's Oregon. Cause that was the yeah. game. I, he, he was somebody I, I, I'm going towards my seventh safety watched and he's the seventh guy I'm watching. And I'm, that was the only game I've seen. I'm pretty sure that was the game. I, he, he came out of yeah. nowhere and just chased him down and made a great play. He fits on like the other side, the run goes the other way and he beelines it runs dude yeah. down, punches ball out. Oregon state gets the ball back. Yeah, it is against Oregon. Um, my head there. Yeah. And do, I mean, and you see the size, he is a thumper uses his size at the tackle point, but Despite that, I thought he moved well for his size in terms of straight line speed and change of direction. He's a dude who I think if he tests well yes. speed-wise and in the agility pieces at that size, high character guy as well, I think he could do something. Because, again, there's a lot of can this guy play as a post safety? Does he have the range? Is he a too high safety only? Is there nickel you know, potential and apex potential? Like where do you put them? How do you see them like – Newbin and Kitchens are really the only ones that I see is straight up. Whatever coverage you want to play on the back end, they can play it and they can do it. Right. Then you get into like, I really like Javon Buller, but then I'm like, okay, like, can he live as a single high post safety with regularity? Or does, and even with his size, does he have to be more of a nickel? Like, can yeah. he Steven live as a, in a too high world? Like, even though he's really good at match coverage and all these pieces that they do at Georgia. And I think again, like this is another position grouping where the combine can go a lot of go a long way in terms of like settling the dust a little bit and starting to be like, okay, now we know who the day two guys are. Here's round two. Here's round three. Here's the round four guys. Here's the seven mm -hmm. and the sixes and the fives. I think the combine could go a long way. Again, settling at the top, I think, and establishing Nubit as the number one. Or maybe we're wrong and Cam Kitchens comes out and runs like a four four eight and does really well, and that conversation gets more intense. Um, but I think that I think the combine will do a lot towards setting the tiers for the safety mm -hmm. position um, throughout the rest of this offseason. Yeah. And I think I think, too, like and you you hit a lot of uh, nails on the head there with a lot of different players. And I, and again, I think it just really circles back to schematics like yeah. some what's guys. Are, what's your scheme? What do you need? Do they fit? Yeah. In? Yeah. And like some guys we might talk about today, we're going to say, yeah, they're third or fourth round value. They might end up going in the second round because schematically they fit a particular team because of what they're running, you know, whether yeah. it be, um, you know, more single high stuff. They want a guy playing down in, in into the, um, into that apex role or they're buzzing down, whatever, whatever it is that they're looking for schematically, that's what it's, what it's going to all be about, um, for, for certain guys. And again, I think the testing plays a big part into it for safeties because they're asked to, Say, for me, I just, I, I, doesn't it feel like safeties are asked to do a little bit more, like come up into the box and tackle. If they're not yes. doing that, they, they got to have the range to fly over the top. They have to have the speed to not get beat deep. Like there's Super so demanding. much, especially in today's NFL, like, all right, can yeah. you play spot drop coverage? Can you play match? Can you function in a too high role? And yeah. both 
can you play in quarters, but also can you get to yeah. the deep half and cover two? Can you play as a single high post safety and cover three? Can you also be the safety that buzzes down both in the hook curl, but also in the flat? Yeah. Can you play sky? Exactly. Or can you play buzz? Who can you man cover against? Right. How do you fit the run? Can you fit the run from depth? Are you a sure tackler coming forward? What do your angles look like? It's such a demanding position. Mm-hmm. And that's why like everything I just rattled off, Newbin and Cam do all that they do all regularity that. Yep. against high like caliber dudes. Everyone else, it's more like projection. Like, okay, mm-hmm. like we think this guy can do this, but it's got to build a little bit. Like it's, yeah, man, especially with, with how defenses operate in college football, I feel like it's, there's a lot asked of them at the NFL level and the transition isn't always like seamless. And it just feels like a lot of guys are more in those simplified roles in the, in, in the college ranks. Like, yes. Okay, you take that half of the field and don't worry about what's going on over there. But then you again, you do find some guys that are asked to do a bunch of different things. Like uh Nazir Adderley, for example, when he was coming out of Delaware. Like oh, I, man, re- yeah. I I still remember how much range he had. It didn't work out for him because of injuries and he ended up retiring and all that stuff. But I it's, loved him paired with pairing him with Derwin James. I thought was going to be the greatest safety tandem ever with the dude, and then they, what he could do. Yeah, and they added Asante Samuel Jr. It was like, dude, this 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 defense is going to be legit and it just never worked out, yeah, but took off. yeah, no, there's just, there's so much to be asked out of safeties. Same thing kind of with like tight ends. You gotta, you gotta run block. You gotta be able to run routes. You have to run them efficiently. You have to be able to catch. You have to be able to catch after the run. You have to be yeah. versatile enough. You can't just be an inline guy or an H back anymore. You have to play in the slot. You got to be mental. Man. It's a mental, it's a mentally and physically demanding position, like the tight end spot, which is yeah. why usually like, the development it's like oh you're one tight ends or kind of whatever it's because their mental yeah. workload is so intense because you're functioning in the run in the pass in a multitude of ways especially like yeah if you're not just an inline guy you're also getting put out and split it's- out and you have to learn all these different things and reading coverages i think safety is a similar piece like you are the safety valve you are the safety blanket the net mm-hmm. on that back end you play a very important spot but also now with you know teams want to go with light boxes to defend the run. Cool. That means you're part of the run fit. Even you're in, even though you're in this too high look, but now also teams are going more heavy personnel. So yeah. cool. can you bang in the box against like a traditional blocking tight end or a sixth offensive lineman? How do you fit that alley? It's a very demanding position mentally and physically. And again, that's why I like Newman and, and cam so much because they've, they've displayed the ability to function in all of those Mm -hmm. like physical demanding roles mentally and physically. And there's a lot of other dudes who I like at safety, but you're not really getting to see it because of the coverages they play or the type of system that they're in that limits the type of coverages. So then it's like, okay, what are his traits? What's his skill set? I watched him cover down on this play one time. It was literally like, makes me think of Dorian Williams last year, linebacker from Tulane that the bills took. I watched like four or five games of his. I watched him carry someone vertically three whole times. <laughs> Everything was spot drop coverage. And I was like, well, this doesn't translate to the NFL. But again, he's long and athletic and fast. So you hope you can coach him up and yada, yada. And it's just, it's so tough to project like that for a position that is so demanding mentally and physically with what is asked of safeties in today's NFL. And also within that, I feel like safety doesn't get prioritized in the draft. Like it's a position that everyone's like, eh, you can get a second or third round safety and be fine. And it's kind of hard to argue like Kyle Duggar, second round safety, Antoine Winfield jr. Second round safety, Jesse Bates, second round safety. Uh, I'm trying to think of all the dudes who have been like, I I, I did it last year too. I remember like charting a bunch, like there's a lot of successful safeties that have been second, third round dudes or like cast off, you know, free agents, Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer became one of the best safety duos in the NFL. And, Hyde was like a jack of all trades defensive back that yeah. was a was a name signing but didn't really garner too much attention. And Poyer was literally a nobody. And look what they right. became. Like it's just it's a weird position, man. And that's why when I see someone like that has the skill set and the traits and the production, like a Nubin or a Cam Kitchens, I'm like, that's somebody that can take your defense to the next level because of yep. what they can do already. And in theory should continue to get better. Yeah. But then there's all well, these I mean, other guys on the back and that could do the same. It's just wild. Well, look at the lions. I mean, I feed him Fonwu, Tracy Walker, Kirby, Joseph, all these guys were third round picks or later. Like you just, Yo. you, you take these guys later and you find ways for them to develop. Uh, one guy I wanted to Uda ask Baker you about, is another second round dude, all yeah. pro safety. Like it's yeah. just, 
where are you with James Williams? What do you do with a guy like that's six foot five, 215 pounds? You got to play him in the box, right? Like he can't. I've watched a ton of Miami games, both every single Miami game for the last, like, I don't know, 15 years I've watched on broadcast. And then all the tape I've watched between last year and this year, I, I just, I, he can't live deep. You need him around the box. Even, you know, this year when he was quote unquote playing safety, you saw his strengths at best with him being more of that cover three box safety, like as a sky or a buzz type of dude, you want him living around the line of scrimmage. I want him to add as much weight as he can while maintaining his agility and his athleticism. And he has to be a a linebacker. The closest I'm getting to him being a safety is being like a big nickel or an apex. Like that's what he's got to be. I just don't think he has the hip fluidity, the coverage instincts and the athleticism to play deep. Like regularly yeah. in, in any, in any type of look, he's not getting anywhere near like a, a split, a post safety type look. And yeah, even no. in like, I don't even think I want him being like a cover two safety, like deep, like it just, I just don't think he has the range and the athleticism for it, but put him around the box with that size and that frame. And that athleticism plays more around the yeah. line of scrimmage. And that's where I'm putting. That's fair. That's fair. No, I think we're on the same page with the safeties. I, I really do. I agree. I agree. Russ, I'm going to throw up the banner and say toodles, folks, because we're going to get the hell out of here. It is crazy. Well, not too crazy late, but it is kind of crazy late. Um, Before anybody leaves, please, 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 thank you. Drop a like on this video. It goes a sincerely long way towards helping myself and the entire team to track and trend in front of more eyes and ears. So please, 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 and thank you. Whether you're watching live now on YouTube or watching later, please, 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 and thank you. Drop a like on this video. It goes a long way. Thank you very much to everyone who joined us live here on this episode. The engagement was good, the back and forth. I appreciate how many people we still got rolling with us here after 11 p.m. Uh, East Coast time. So I appreciate everybody dropping by the engagement, the thoughts, the engagement with each other, with myself and Russ. Thank you very much to Silas for both your super chats. Appreciate the hell out of you. And I always expect to see you around come draft time and appreciate you seeing you uh, back here on Disguise Coverage. So thank you very much for that. If you are listening on one of the podcasting apps or platforms, thank you very much for your listen, your download, whatever have you. Please rate and review and subscribe to Disguised Coverage. Turn on notifications for the Disguised Coverage playlist here on YouTube and subscribe to the Cover One channel as a whole. And as RJ says here, awesome show as always for the NFL Steiner brothers. I normally don't bring up positive things that are said about me during the the closing part of the show because I think it's corny, but I did for this instance because I love our nickname, but also it allows me to transition and segue to the main person I need to thank for this episode. And that is you, Russ, Mr. Russell Brown, draft analyst for fantasy pros and betting pros and doing Lions stuff for Lions Wire. Um, I meant to when I said it when I I, uh, brought you in in the intro of – you know, just how much, you know, and how good of a dude you are. I enjoy talking ball with you, whether it's in person at the senior bowl, um, everything, you know, all the food and spots we were hitting up throughout that week and practices and everything, but just what it is now with us, like texting and going over players and evaluation pieces and being able to bring you on. I try to bring you on as much as I physically possibly can with the schedule with yours and mine, um, come draft season, just cause you know, so much and you're such a good evaluator and I a talent. And so, Floor is yours. Tell everybody who you are, where they can find you in case they don't know. I appreciate the hell out of you. No, yeah, no, look, always appreciate uh, the opportunity to come on and and circle back to to my team here at cover one. I'm still like, feel like I'm still kind of part of it, you know, in a, you know, by heart or whatever, but uh, Mm -hmm. no, I think that's why we go two plus hours every single time I come on just because we love talking ball. We love chopping it up. Um, we get down the wrestling tangents and then we get into the football stuff and it's just, it's always a blast. Um, and but you're no, somebody yeah. who I know I can like, I don't have to stick to like these four players. Like I can speak about like an entire position group and that's what we did. Like we start rattling <laughs> off names. It's an hour in itself. A hundred percent. Like, what do you think of this guy? What do you think of that guy? Yeah. I saw him in this game. Do this. Yeah. But I saw him in that game. Do that. And it's just like, I, you just, it's just awesome. You have to be able to talk about it. Sorry. I got excited. Continue. Go ahead. Florida. No, you're Sorry. good. You're good. Um, no, it's always a blast and you know, draft season is upon us. So it's, it's been great. Uh, I'm excited for the combine to get started, uh, which I think is either tomorrow or Thursday. Can't remember. Um, I think it's Thursday. It's Thursday. It's definitely Thursday. I think it's defensive um, and ends on Thursday or line stuff is on Thursday. I just remember wide receivers is the weekend. Um, yeah. And DBs. It's so weird now, now that it's like, not during the day all the time now. And it's like nighttime each day and they've separated up into group. I'm still adjusting to the new combine yeah, schedule, which I'm glad they did. I like Agreed. that. It's not at like 8 AM and it's like, they give yes. the 
players and all that. So no, I, I'm excited. Um, but no, I always appreciate you having me on. It's, it's always a lot of fun whenever you you're in a bind or you just want to bring some down and talk ball, let me know. Um, you guys, of course, can find all my work at fantasypros.com, at bettingpros.com, lionswire.com, at the Detroit Lions podcast, uh, at Russ NFL Draft. Just drop a follow and follow along that way. But always appreciate it. Always a blast being back here on uh, Disguise Coverage and Cover One. Oh, yeah. You're one of my favorite follows, favorite ball knowers, and just people in general at this point. Uh, I appreciate the hi. Thank you for taking the time. Appreciate all you folks watching again live, later, whatever have you. Uh, go get yourself some one pie pizza. Again, the online menu can be found in the episode show notes, whether here on YouTube or whichever podcasting app or platform you are listening to this show on delicious sweet sauce, pie, cup of char pepperoni, homemade blue cheese. They're good people making great food. They do a lot for the community and give back. Get yourself some one pie pizza until next Tuesday, 9 PM Eastern for another episode of disguise coverage. That'll do it for us here on this week. I hope everybody goes and gets some sleep. Enjoy the rest of what's left of your Tuesday evening slash Tuesday <laughs> night. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much to you, Russ, um, for everybody watching or listening. I hope you and your family and friends and loved ones are all doing well and staying safe. Be kind to one another. Take care of one another. I will see you next Tuesday for another episode of Disguise Coverage. There's no film room tomorrow slash this week with myself and Eric. We're taking a week off uh, because we have a bunch of other projects that we've been working on. So no film room this week. Um, so we'll see you next week. Tuesday, 9 p.m. Eastern for another episode of Disguise Coverage, and then a film room the day after, Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern. But until then, Godspeed, and as always, go Bills.